people have we got listening? Roughly? Well, we don't know how many people got listening. We've got about 600 people registered. Okay. Okay, so it is possible to unmute. That's good. I will mute myself, put the music back on. And then, Jim, if you can then restart the YouTube stream. Sorry, we should be streaming. To, we're streaming to YouTube now. Yes, because I, now I, there is our audio and this as a beginning. And that will also be in the archive. So it would be good to stop and start again. Yeah? Yeah, just a sec. I'm getting a bit of uh, interference here. Okay, all right. You're getting the YouTube stream as well, I guess.
Good morning. And welcome to the uh, 35th uh, AMSAT UK Colloquium. Uh, we are very lucky today. We've got presenters from five countries. We've got nine total presentations and more than 500 people, uh, friends, uh, registered to view on uh, on Zoom and probably many more on YouTube. So um, with no further ado, it gives me great pleasure to turn the microphone over to our chairman, uh, some Professor Sir Martin Sweeting, to perform the official opening. Right, well, very good morning, very good afternoon, a uh, very good evening to wherever you are in the world listening to this virtual 35th AMSAT uh, uh, UK colloquium. I, I hope that everybody is uh, well and staying safe under these difficult uh, circumstances, um, which, however, have allowed us to run this as a virtual event. And as Graham has just said, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome more than 600 folk from all the way around the world who are participating in the, the colloquium uh, this weekend. Um, it's been a very active year, and we're going to hear all about that uh, throughout the sessions today. Um, a lot of uh, uh, space activity, and of course, with our new satellites now, we're spanning from essentially HF, uh, high HF and VHF up to uh, uh, microwaves and X-band. So fantastic uh, developments for the amateur satellite uh, community. However, before we start the sessions, it's really uh, a very great pleasure for me to announce to whom we're going to award the G3 AAJ Cup this year. Um, the Cup is in remembrance of uh, G3 AAG, Ron Broadbent, G3 AAJ, Ron Broadbent, who was our on sec for many years and a very active uh, uh, proponent of AMSAT. And in his memory, we have this uh, award annually. And this year, uh, we are, have awarded the Cup to Colin Hurst, VK5HI, for his contributions to uh, uh, satellites. And I'm going to hand over or hand back to Graham, who's going to just summarize his contribution and, and also say a few words on behalf of uh, Graham. Over to you, Colin. Uh, <laughs> over to Graham to talk about Colin. Thanks, Martin. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, if you type Colin's call sign VK5HI uh, into Google, there are many hits. Uh, many, many, many hits. Uh, many of them are from owners of satellites expressing their appreciation of his efforts in observing their particular spacecraft. He was a regular contributor to the AMSAT UK Australia column in the Journal of the Wireless, of, Wireless Institute of Australia. The one in back in May 1988 um, was about Oscar, th sorry, a UOSAT 3, which at the time was being prepared for launch. When Funky One was successfully launched in November 2013, we were very keen to receive as much data as we could about our spacecraft. And we were delighted to get from Colin plots of the measured rotation rate of the spacecraft as determined by him from the, all the onboard uh, sensors. Little did we realize uh, that Colin's efforts would continue over so many years. And even now we continue to receive regular weekly updates of the rotation rates and direction of the spacecraft. Uh, there are many features of the changes that occur over time that we still do not quite understand. And some months ago, he was able to identify that Funky One occasionally demonstrates the, and I will get the pronunciation wrong, so I apologize to any Russian uh, viewers, the Dzanbekov phenomena in space. For those aware, not aware, Dzanbekov was a USS cosmonaut who noticed that spinning nuts on Mir would suddenly flip round the other way. The videos made at that time were quite amazing. Whilst there have only been a few periods when Colin has not been able to download the data, mainly when he's been on an occasional fishing trip uh, to the outback with no computer, as he says, and no phone, he always gets one of his uh, VK colleagues to call, uh, cover for him. So for the, his great contribution to amateur, the Amateur Satellite Service over many decades, AMSAT UK has much pleasure to award 
Colin Hurst, VK5HI, the G3 AAJ Trophy for 2020. Back to you, Martin. Right, just making sure I'm unmuted. So there's a bit of a delay on the uh, the mute button. Right, thank you very much, Graham. And uh, indeed, it's uh, um, a great pleasure to uh, award this to Connie. I have, of course, a personal thanks as well for all the work done on the early USATs because uh, those were challenging times for us and they laid the foundation for, for what now is a, a very active uh, commercial activity in, in SSTL, um, but also continuing uh, on the amateur side as well. Um, now, I believe Colin, you have a, sorry, Graham, you have a, a few words from, uh, from Colin in uh, response? Yes, okay. Um, yeah, he's, um, we, we did cheat and let him know in advance that uh, he was going to receive this award and he sent us a, I was about to say a telex, but that shows my age. Uh, he sent us an email with a few words, um, which I'd like to read out on his behalf. Uh, I feel extremely honored to be the recipient of the AAJ Trophy, G3 AAJ Trophy for 2020. My interest in telemetry collection and, and analysis goes back to Oscar 7, when data downloads at this QTH revolved around a Creed 7B teleprinter. Put your hand up if you uh, remember a Creed 7B teleprinter. Analysis required the use of a slide rule or log tables, and the printout was on graph paper using colored pencils. Today, downloading is automated using software modems. Data is analyzed with specific macro code that outputs color, uh, color graphic printouts. The interpretation of the graphic printouts has always been a challenge, and Oscar, and Oscar 73, AO 73 has certainly been that for almost seven years, but it's been an enjoyable seven years with many more hopefully to follow. In conclusion, I would like to thank Terry VK5GU and Colin VK3HBF who have supported me on the occasions when I was unable to do daily downloads and analysis. Thank you and it's signed Colin VK5HI. Martin. Yep, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Graham. And again, I'd like to add my thanks, and I do not only recall the Creed 7B teleprinter, uh, but also slide rules uh, and uh, also the famous osculator, which uh, preceded the use of computers for, uh, for tracking satellites in low Earth orbit at the time. So congratulations, uh, Colin, and uh, many thanks from me and, of course, from the whole community that has benefited from the uh, hard work that you and your colleagues have uh, done and uh, I hope you will enjoy the uh, uh, AAJ trophy. Um, it now is uh, a great pleasure to kick off the the main sessions that we're going to have uh, today and the first one is uh, going to be chaired by uh, uh, Kieran Morgan, uh, M0 X-ray Tango Delta. Um, Kieran is a retired systems engineer who uh, gained his full amateur license in uh, 2008 just in time to conduct the uh, Richard Garriott ARIS contact with the Budbroke School. He's currently active in the uh, ARIS operations team where he is the UK lead uh, for contacts and mentoring as well as the global secular for all school contract. So Kieran is uh, the RSGB representative to ARIS International and is uh, working on the concept of operations, uh, so-called CONOPS, uh, for the AR well, ARX Lunar Gateway Project. Bit of a mouthful, that one. Um, he's certainly busy, and we're lucky to have him uh, looking after these matters uh, uh, for us, and we appreciate all the effort, of course, that's gone in over many years in, in supporting ARIS. So over to you, Kieran, and kick off the, pro the uh, panels today. Thank you, Martin, and uh, welcome everyone to the uh, AMSAC colloquium today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, ARIS in terms of uh, both UK and uh, global activities and to uh, give you an opportunity to ask any questions if you want. So what I'm aiming to, co to cover today is uh, a little bit about operations in the UK in the past year. Uh, operations worldwide, especially in the COVID um, era. Uh, a little bit about the interoperable radio system, which is our new radio that we have had installed on the Columbus module in uh, on the ISS. 
And then a little bit about Arex, amateur radio exploration, so to the moon and beyond in effect. So what has this year been like for uh, Aris in the UK? Well, it's very, very quiet. Um, unfortunately, our only event, which was to be the EMF 2020, was cancelled due to COVID-19 concerns, as was EMF 2020 itself. Our next planned event in the UK will be April 2021, where the Mary Hare School in uh, Newbury will hopefully be making a contact with uh, the ISS itself. Worldwide, uh, as I've said there, um, operations have been heavily disrupted due to COVID-19. And uh, as a consequence, we lost access to several telebridge stations uh, in the US uh, and Italy, in fact, as well, due to them being on school premises or on NASA premises themselves. Many of those telebridge stations are still out of service to us, so we're operating with a reduced level of um, uh, cover at the moment, although we do have uh, uh, an alternative station that has been set up in New Hampshire uh, to help us uh, in the present period. The biggest problem that we encountered was that we couldn't perform our traditional direct or telebridge contacts. Um, the COVID-19 rules everywhere basically ruled out large gatherings in any way, shape or form, and we spent uh, a lot of time, uh, and uh, John Clute K4SQC uh, over in the US helped to develop a new method called a multi-point telebridge, which is a telebridge contact, but where the participants were all situated at their homes. Uh, it ended up being extremely successful. We've carried out several of them, including one or two in Europe, and uh, looked to be the main form of most contacts whilst we're battling with the um, with the COVID situation. With the help of Aris Russia, we've had several very well received SSTV events. Um, we've seen a very wide range of engagement as, as well with those from people using full blown satellite setups to receive the SSTV pictures, right through to people with a radio and a, an app on their phone um, being very successful as well in receiving um, the, uh, the the series of pictures. In fact, the, the last series, which was uh, 16 pictures, I believe, has only just finished this last week. Unfortunately, Ham TV still remains on, the, on Earth being repaired, but we're hoping that uh, the repairs will be effective and expected to be reflown to the ISS sometime in 2021. Now, I mentioned the interoperable radio system, and uh, I've mentioned this a couple of times over the years at ARIS activities and ARIS uh, uh, AMSAT colloquium. Um, but uh, this is uh, the new radio system, which is based on a Kenwood D710 uh, radio uh, and a multi voltage power supply, which is this gold colored box um, in the middle of the picture. This marks a new um, uh, chapter for us on 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 board the uh, the ISS, as it gives us back an awful lot of capability, both VHF and UHF uh, itself. The interoperable radio system was flown to the ISS on SpaceX CRS twenty in March twenty twenty, and in very early September uh, this year, it was installed by uh, Commander Chris Cassidy. Um, and has been successfully operating in the crossband repeater mode for a, a, a number of weeks. It's recently been switched to the digipeter mode and from by judging from the um, uh, reports that we've seen on Twitter and the like, uh, it seems to be very well received, especially with the new NA1SS call sign. For those of you that are interested, it's a normal five five watt downlink um, for digipeter and crossband repeater mode. But whenever we do school contacts, we're now looking at 25 watts. And uh, certainly the reports that we've had have been booming in 
uh, or booming signals uh, when school contacts have been taking place. Like I said, there's uh, another picture of it. It's an incredibly small unit. Um, the, uh, the cables that you see are uh, specially coated to uh, prevent uh, flame uh, uh, retarding, retardant facilities. Uh, and also uh, hot off the press, a picture that shows it installed in the Columbus module and being operated by uh, Commander Chris Cassidy. So that takes us on to the AREX, the Amateur Radio Exploration or the Gateway Amateur Radio Exploration uh, activities. This is all to do with the return to the moon and whether uh, it's possible to do outreach uh, from the moon. But before I do that, we're just going to show you a picture of the uh, approximate orientation of the, the gateway, the lunar gateway itself. Um, as you can see, it's pointing direct at the sun at all times and will be earth facing for uh, the vast majority of the time that it is uh, operational. We have several different modules for the uh, gateway itself. We've got the power and propulsion element, which is the, the, the main key element at the back um, to help power the unit. We've got a habitation and logistics outpost, uh, which will be the living quarters for the uh, crew when they are around the moon. And we've also got a logistics module. And it's on this logistics module that we are looking to focus our attention uh, for the coming uh, couple of years in terms of outreach. So a question for everyone. We've, we've been doing uh, STEAM education or STEM education in low Earth orbit using the, the in, uh, International Space Station. But is it possible to do it with the uh, amateur radio infrastructure in deep space? Well, weak signal long path length challenges are achievable and have previously been demonstrated by the ARIS and the AMSAT teams. In fact, weak signal reception is an amateur radio operator challenge in order to uh, test the skills of um, amateur radio operators. And AMSAT satellites, especially AO40, has been used to demonstrate GPS weak signal reception beyond geostationary orbit. And uh, as a consequence of that experiment on, on AO40, uh, NASA is now using GPS halfway to the moon. AMSAT and ARIS teams have tracked and received data from Voyager, Cassini, uh, Venus radar and several lunar missions and the Chinese uh, radio amateurs have recently operated Longjiang 1 and 2 from around the moon and there is a prize for the first human amateur radio contact between Earth and Mars. So in response yes it is possible to do STEM, STEM education and this is what we have been spending uh, uh, quite a bit of the, the year looking at and trying to decide how best to do it. That led us on to the concept of the payload and what would a payload look like. As I mentioned, the logistics units are the, uh, the main units that we are focusing on at the moment. And we have everything divided into two systems. The Mark I system, which is the minimally capable educational outreach system, and which is targeted to, to fly the earliest. Um, uh, would be an externally mounted satellite based on the ARIS, uh, ARISAT um, bodies that we, uh, we currently, or the space bodies that we currently still have. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures of, uh, of how those are proposed to look uh, in a moment. We're proposing to develop two to three copies of a spacecraft. Um, uh, that can be externally mounted to the logistics module and, and flown to support human lunar spaceflight missions. The whole setup is uh, based on the principle of a simple ground station using commercial off-the-shelf components and AREX embedded software, firmware and data interfaces that we develop as part of the, uh, the, the process. 
Uh, I did mention a, a delivery time scale or the fly in the soonest. And uh, the idea is to get this to coincide with the uh, very early 2024 uh, proposals for uh, Boots on the Moon um, itself. A Mark II system, which is uh, a little bit later, um, would be a fully capable system uh, internally mounted on the gateway, employing RF feed throughs to a, an earth pointed 0.6 meter dish or a flat plate antenna. Again, we're looking at a simple ground station using COTS components and embedded software firmware itself. And this timescale uh, for us is a little bit later, 2026, 2027. So just concentrating on the Mark I overview for a short while, the, uh, as I said, we're looking at using the Arasat space frames that we have currently available. These are human spaceflight certified units and we've got three of them uh, available. Uh, we're looking at putting a commandable antenna or camera array, um, something that we've nicknamed a, a communications video hat or a CV hat. Uh, and it eliminates the necessity for pointing um, systems itself. And you can see on the diagram uh, a little explanation or a little uh, uh, indication, sorry, uh, of the uh, the CV hat itself. Now, depending upon the uh, capability and the visibility from the um, uh, from the gateway itself, we may end up having to deploy the CV hat on an extendable boom. Uh, or a deployable boom uh, to give us the visibility of Earth that uh, we would need itself. But the idea would be that the CV hat would be a uh, almost like a passive antenna type type thing where each of the faces have had uh, a, a patch antenna and uh, would allow us to select the, the, the antenna with the best uh, signal reception. So I mentioned about software firmware, the, um, uh, the, the, the basis of the, the whole system would be an enhanced software defined radio employing DVB-S2X technology for simple grind station software transmit and receive. So something very similar to the technology that has been used for Q100 and indeed many of the stations, we would expect many of the stations that have been successful in Q100 would want to have a go at uh, attempting to receive from the Mark I system. Importantly for us, the equipment and the space frames would have interfaces for STEAM student investigations, and I'll come on to talk about those uh, a, little, a little later. And uh, we would uh, use systems and interfaces that have been developed through Arasat itself, along with the pioneering DVBS. Uh, S2 technologies that have been in, in, uh, employed on Aris Ham TV uh, to uh, increase the, uh, the appeal of the, the system. The Mark I system supports voice, lunar earth pictures, television, but most probably low bandwidth, experimental data, Twitter like messages, and the ability to tele robot command between schools a little bit like uh, trying to send a message via the uh, DigiPeter on the ISS at the moment. As I mentioned, the uh, opportunity to use uh, Q100 type stations means that we're looking at an X-band downlink in order to get the bandwidth itself. And we have a con uh, contingency uplink downlink on the 70 centimeter band as well. Our normal uplink uh, band would be on the C band and uh, normal modulation would be DVB-S 2X, which allows us to support the greatest amount of uh, modes for, for use. We have a contingency uplink and downlink and, and this is where the weak signal analysis, uh, the weak signals come in and uh, we're looking at the potential for things such as JT65, FT8, Olivia, MFSK16, or BPSK31. 
I mentioned the interfaces. There are going to be four ports, um, and uh, much like we did for the uh, Marconista project, uh, have the ability to link the school, link the projects into the main space frame, um, and uh, the data as well. And as I've said, the uh, we can support technology demonstrations and space investigations. Uh, similar to the AO40 GPS technology uh, experiment uh, or the ISS Marconista experiment. But what, uh, what, do, what does this all mean in terms of STEAM and STEM outreach? Well, this is where the CONOPS, the concept of operations has come into it. And we've spent a little bit of time this year trying to do something that leverages a lot of the experience that we've had from ARIS for the last 20 years and indeed the MARX and the SARX experiments in the shuttle and Mir space stations as well. We wanted it to be something that was interactive and inspiring with crew members when crew members were present. Uh, remember that the gateway is only proposed to be uh, crewed for periods of uh, probably about a month or two uh, per 12 months. We wanted it to be usable with or without the crew members present. We wanted to, uh, as we do now, continue to engage with the widest possible audience. And we wanted some flexibility in terms of changing when uh, opportunities and, and new missions arise. And this could mean opportunities to put equipment on the surface of the moon itself as well. So CONOPS, we divided them into three different modes. We had an amateur mode, uh, an educational outreach mode, and an experimental scientific mode. The amateur mode itself was expected to be operational when all other modes were not selected, and uh, it, essentially the, the default mode. And this would in use, involve the development and use of amateur radio equi equipment in various modes, such as voice and video transponders. It would include the uh, ability of random contacts by the crew from lunar orbit, um, as and when the opportunities permitted, and is expected to be controlled and managed in an autonomous manner from Earth, including when the gateway is crewed. So reducing as much of the uh, impact upon the crew as possible. Educational outreach mode uh, is something that uh, we would expect to be used um, on, on very regular occasions and is available for both crewed and uncrewed scenarios. With a crewed scenario, we have live two-way communication exchanges similar to the existing ARIS contacts between schools and the crew members on the gateway. And we believe this would be a, a very inspirational uh, approach to, uh, to STEAM and uh, uh, STEM activities uh, in lunar orbit. And like I said, it would all be controlled from Earth with little or no in, uh, in crew involvement um, in terms of uh, setting, setting it up. When the, the um, lunar gateway is uncrewed, we would have the capability to um, program the system so that a series of transmissions can be targeted towards schools and pupils worldwide. Um, we could include um, modes such as the uh, existing SSTV on the ISS and uh, simple um, experiments for, for school kids to uh, receive the, uh, the signals. We could potentially also have uh, lessons from space being published on a, on a predetermined schedule so that people are able to, to look at it uh, and, uh, and incorporate it into their, um, into their daily routine uh, in schools themselves. And again, and importantly, this is all managed from, from Earth, uh, especially when the gateway is, is crewed. But perhaps one of the most exciting ones that uh, we, we have in terms of the CONOPS is this experimental scientific mode. And the idea would be for this to be uh, operational for defined periods of time. It's targeted at radio amateurs and university level undergraduates and postgraduates to propose new or novel uses of the amateur radio equipment 
including potentially any sensors that are available to us to investigate spectrum behaviors and properties. We, we would envisage that we would do a call for proposals uh, issuing worldwide, uh, asking for ideas, and a panel of experts would select the project or projects uh, to be carried out after a detailed analysis of the proposals. The timetable for operating uh, the experiment would be agreed between the proposer and the AREX technical team, and the AREX technical team would expect open reporting of results to amateurs and university report stroke theses. As I said, the installed capability um, uh, would rely on science payloads and, and we may have the ability to access other facilities on board the Lunar Gateway, such as Earth or space facing cameras or different types of sensors. And these could be incorporated into the experimental and scientific mode uh, itself. If you think that's all very uh, ambitious and very, uh, uh, engaging. Um, what you should do is have a quick look at the actual development schedule that's been uh, proposed for the whole thing. We've already gone through the um, the requirements definition. We've spent uh, several months this year working our way through it, and we are currently in the preliminary design investigation or de de uh, development phase with a design review targeted for sometime in December itself. Uh, with uh, final design uh, maturation and uh, everything occurring during 2021, with the idea that hardware would start to be developed in December 2021, uh, right through to July or so of 2022. But the, uh, the, the ultimate goal is having spaceflight ready equipment in November 2023 uh, for inclusion on the, the modules, on the logistic modules in 2024, uh, and hopefully some, some, uh, some good experimental uh, activities uh, for the amateurs um, when the Lunar Gateway finally does launch. And that is it. So thank you very much for listening. Um, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, please feel free to uh, to ask the questions, and I think Jim is going to uh, monitor the uh, the questions for us. So thank you very much, folks. Yeah, over to Jim, who was around a minute ago. There he is. Jim, you're muted. Yeah, thanks very much, Kieran. Uh, really interesting. And um, uh, it's, it seems that despite all the difficulties that COVID has uh, brought along, that uh, the ARIS programme is doing some really long term forward thinking with some exciting, exciting projects. Um, there are a few questions in, in the Q&A, um, but I'm not going to pose them to you just at the moment, Kieran. Um, I wondered if you could just go into the Q&A box and ask, answer them by by um, just typing in the Q&A box, um, because we are running a little bit short of time. Can you do okay. that? Okay, yep, I'll do that. So I'll answer the questions uh, in, in a few moments for everybody. Yeah, thanks very much. Take, take, a, take a breather. So anyone who's asked a question, don't um, hound Kieran too much. He's uh, maybe, maybe having a coffee. Kieran, thanks very much indeed for a really interesting talk. Round of applause, <laughs> which we can't Thank you very do. much. <laughs> now look, um, the next thing we've got on the agenda is um, uh, the dreaded, um, uh, so it's not dreaded, the ever popular um, raffle. Uh, this, this uh, I'm hoping you can uh, see this slide, uh, which have very brief rules on this raffle. Um, it, it is free, but you have to uh, have registered before it's free to all those people who registered, but you had to register before six o'clock last night to give us a chance to set it up. And you have to at least attend part of the colloquium to win a prize. And uh, I should be notifying uh, prize winners, at least not notifying, but confirming, contacting prize winners um, after the, uh, fairly soon after we, after we finish. I've got a very special um, 
wheel of fortune here, which we're going to uh, uh, use to uh, draw the first raffle. Um, just bear me a sec. Oops, so just do that again. Uh, It's that Wheel of Fortune, and uh, you can see we've got all the delegates on the uh, right-hand side, and I can give them a shuffle. And I can't. I gave them a shuffle earlier on. Um, oh, this hasn't frozen on me. Um, I'm going to have to restart this by the sound of it. You know, it's not responding. Um, QRX again. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, I won't do this now. I'll fix it during the next talk and uh, we might have two draws uh, on, on the next break. Uh, it's a little uh, application that's obviously not, uh, not responding. So I'll pass over to, uh, uh, to Graham to uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jim. Uh, it's worth waiting for. Uh, let me tell you, the Jim's uh, Wheel of Fortune has had uh, uh, has had the team in fits of laughter during some of our rehearsals. Rehearsals, you say? You've, you've had rehearsals? It's not obvious. Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, uh, just another point uh, in terms of timing for this event. Uh, we are running in BST, British Summertime, so don't be too confused by that. Um, you take an hour off uh, UTC GMT and then uh, uh, then uh, uh, work out your local uh, local time from that. Um, and there was another announcement I was going to make. If you want to see the program, just check on our website, the AMSAT UK website, and the program is up there on the front. Uh, and it, when we get a gap between the presentations, the program will also uh, will also be shown there. Anyway, thank you, as, uh, as Jim has said, thank you, Kieran. Uh, uh, Kieran is, as has been said, one of our very busy uh, AMSAT UK uh, committee members, does a whole uh, myriad of different things, including keeping track of all the funds as well. So uh, uh, we, uh, we're very grateful to him. One of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the stars, I think, of the next generation of radio amateurs is going to be talking to us next. Uh, Daniel Estevez, EA4GPZ, well, he also has a, a UK call sign G0HXM. Uh, he's, uh, I was going to say, only been a radio amateur since 2014, but um, comes from certainly the next generation from where I'm, where I'm sitting. Uh, his main interests are the scientific and technical aspects of radio. He has a PhD in maths, math mathematics, and currently works as a satellite navigation engineer at GMV. One of his passions in amateur radio is everything to do with satellites and space. Uh, and he's the author of the GR Satellites Decoding uh, software. He has collaborated in the Longyang 2 Chinese lunar mission and other amateur satellite missions. He's also obviously a member of AMSAT uh, EA. Uh, occasionally you might catch him calling CQ on QO100 or doing weird digital experiments. So Daniel, please tell us a little more about these activities. Uh, thank you very much, Graham, and thank you to AMSAT UK for putting together this uh, wonderful e event today. So let's go ahead with my presentation. Hopefully you can see my screen now, yes. Uh, today I'm going to talk of a project we've been doing about decoding the spacecraft which were recently launched to Mars. So I might start uh, with the list of the people involved in these activities because I'm here today speaking, but uh, there's a long list of people who have collaborated with these kind of experiments. Uh, first of all, we have Paul Marsh uh, from the UK, who has been uh, really the first one who uh, picked our interest with uh, these DSN activities. Paul has a very long personal history about tracking uh, deep spacecraft with his own amateur station at home. Then we also have our friend Jakub from Czech Republic, 
who is an expert in decoding telemetry data from satellites. We also have many people from AMSA-DL uh, who operate the telescope or the radio observatory at Bochum. We'll see a bit more about that in the next few slides. And Achim and Mario and other people have been uh, helping us uh, putting interesting ideas forward and so on. And uh, AMSA DL is huge. It takes a huge team to, to mount the Bochum uh, 20 meter antenna. So probably I'm uh, skipping uh, even more people on the list. We also have James Miller, uh, G3 RUH, who's uh, probably the technical operator of the, of the uh, dish at uh, Bochum. Uh, he's been doing wonderful studies about the Doppler of the spacecrafts. And also all the few amateurs, uh, Edgar from Germany, Fer from Italy and Graham from the UK, who have helped us uh, tracking the spacecraft with their own stations. I also would like to thank uh, John Giorgini from JPL at NASA. If you uh, track this space spacecraft, you probably use Horizon for getting the ephemeris. So John is the person behind that. And also Bill Gray uh, from Project Pluto for sharing with us his optical observations. At the beginning of our project, when we were trying to find Tianwen-1 in the sky, and trying to uh, match our trajectory with the spacecraft. Bill used uh, observations from optical telescopes to put together some data and we could compare us with, uh, with his data. So the spacecraft I'm going to talk today are three, which were launched in July, all of them uh, towards Mars. This is not a coincidence. We have launched windows to Mars every couple of years, approximately. So spacecraft get clusters within a few weeks when the launch opportunity is ready. Uh, these are Emirates Mars mission from the United uh, Arab Emirates, Tianwen-1 from China, which will be the main focus in this talk, and Mars 2020 from USA. And here you can see a picture uh, that Jonathan McDowell shared on Twitter where you can see the uh, Earth here, Mars here. This is 21 September, so we have the cluster spacecraft already halfway to Mars. And we have the uh, HOPE spacecraft here, Tianwen-1 in here, Mars 2020 in here. And you can also see the rockets that propelled all these spacecraft towards Mars. So Emirates Mars mission is the first uh, Arab mission uh, to another planet. And as such, it's an orbiter to study Mars atmosphere. It has a large uh, dish antenna to communicate with Earth. But the problem is that the polarization is left hand. And uh, right hand is the usual norm for this kind of uh, deep spacecraft. So if you have your station rigged up for right hand polarization, then that's a problem. Tianwen-1 is an orbiter and, and rover from China. Uh, we have the rover here on the descent capsule and the orbital, which will provide communications with her using this large antenna. This is an actual picture of the spacecraft uh, traveling towards Mars that was published a few days ago uh, by China. And uh, the particular thing about this spacecraft is that there is very little information published. There are no frequencies published in ITU, no orbital information. So Paul, Edgar, and all the amateurs were able to find this spacecraft shortly after launch, transmitting at uh, this frequency. The way you do it is you use a spectrum analyzer to have uh, wide frequency coverage, you know uh, it's going to be around 8.4 uh, gigahertz. And you use a simple uh, feed antenna, which gives you a wide coverage to look uh, mostly to all the sky. And uh, you know the day when it's launched, when it's going to appear over the horizon and so on. 
Next, we come to Mars 2020. This is a very exciting mission from the US because it has a rover, but also helicopter drone. This is the first time we will be operating a spacecraft in another planet. So Mars has a thinner atmosphere than Earth, but it's already enough to support flight. So quite interesting. Uh, it is not an orbiter, it's, it is just a capsule to send uh, the rover and helicopter to the surface of Mars. So there is very little in the spacecraft, only uh, a few things to support the journey. And uh, we don't have a large high gain antenna. We only have a medium gain antenna in here. So the signal is not particularly strong now that it is uh, probably 20 million kilometers away from Earth. How can we receive these spacecraft? Well, first of all, they tend to transmit in X-band, uh, that is uh, between 8.4 and 8.45 gigahertz. And uh, there's not uh, readily available commercial equipment on that frequencies that you can go to the shop and buy as you buy a Yesu or another uh, ham transceiver. So you must, made, uh, you must make your microwave equipment at home using surplus parts or self-built equipment. Uh, this involves a dish, of course, a uh, feed, uh, an LNA and dump converter, etc. And then can, you can have your uh, more conventional uh, radio or SDR receiver. You can put up a dish on your backyard. And uh, this is a picture of Paul's uh, dish in uh, his garden. I keep forgetting the size. I think it's uh, 1.8 meters or something like that. But even a small 60 centimeters dish is already enough to pick uh, some of the spacecraft signals, especially when these are near Earth uh, because they've been launched uh, recently, right? Uh, but we can also use something larger. And uh, we can go to Bochum. Uh, Bochum is Bochum Observatory in uh, Germany. This is uh, managed and operated by AMSA DL, and it's a real treasure for the amateur radio community. Here you can see the antenna in a ray dome, so it's protected from weather. It's uh, 20 meters, so quite large. Uh, keep in mind that professional DSN antennas uh, for receiving these spacecraft are uh, maybe 34 meters or 70 meters at most. So at 20 meters, we are a bit shorter than the professional stations, but uh, quite comparable performance. This can uh, receive in S-band, uh, ranging from the uh, professional S-band uh, to our amateur S-band at 2.4 gigahertz. Also professional X-band at 8.4. Uh, our amateur X-band at 10 gigahertz, and it can also transmit in, in S-band. If everything with your station works well, uh, you'll be able to see some kind of signal in your spectrum, in your SDR receiver or recording. And this is uh, the Emirate Arabs uh, mission received by Paul shortly after launch. This is Tianwen-1 received by Bochum, and this is Mars 2020 received by Bochum. So this is very, very strong signals here, you can see lots of sidebands above the noise floor. If the signal is weak, as you can expect with a small dish when you, the spacecraft is away from Earth, you can picture the noise floor here and only the central carrier, teeny tiny, will pop up over the noise floor. But if you have fairly strong uh, sidebands, as in here, you can see the data sidebands. Uh, this lobe, uh, these side lobes, and this main lobe are used to transmit data, digital data from the spacecraft. We use GNU radio to decode this digital data. And uh, we can do this in real time from live data or working from recordings. I'm not going to speak too much about GNU radio. I gave a month ago a uh, talk at the uh, GNU radio conference, uh, looking at all uh, the details about how this is done, and hopefully the recording of the talk will appear soon enough. 
So we end up with the received frames decoded on a file on a computer. But then there's a huge question, what do all these bits mean? Uh, we have lots of frames, uh, lots of different uh, bits and bytes, uh, meaning different things, but usually we don't have no idea. Uh, this isn't documented anywhere. We are trying to guess. And one of the things we do to figure things out is to plot uh, the bytes in some image, as you can see here. So in here we have uh, different frames of the same type. Each of the frames is uh, raw on this data. So we have almost 900 uh, different frames and each of the bytes is one of the columns. So you can see that the uh, fields stuck up and you can see here three fields which seem to be something I will spoil you. Uh, they are three floating point numbers. And here we see one byte which is on and then suddenly turns off. So we can we can see the behavior. We can see how they change, uh, how to group uh, different bytes. But it's usually quite difficult to guess what these numbers really mean. There might be voltages, temperatures, angle, anything going on inside the spacecraft. So here, what has uh, switched off or toggled, I have no idea. Uh, we would need to be lucky or to gain some insight about uh, the internal uh, workings about the spacecraft to be sure what this is. But sometimes uh, we are able to figure out some of these things and we gain some knowledge about the internals of the spacecraft. Here you can see four telemetry channels uh, from Mars 2020. Uh, clearly they show the same uh, kind of oscillations. It is a pretty uh, picture, but what do they mean? I actually have no clue. Uh, to know we would uh, have to localize something in this spacecraft which is oscillating in the same way and uh, be able to match it with the data. But sometimes we're lucky. Sometimes we see something obvious. For example, this ASCII text uh, that Root uh, was the first to detect in March 2020, there are these idle frames when there is no uh, interesting or meaningful data being transmitted. And instead of sending out just zeros or any of the padding data, the uh, team uh, put this uh, little, little Easter egg with some ASCII text uh, with uh, names of engineers, a quote from uh, from Brown and uh, one of the titles of uh, Deep Purple songs. So in fact, you can see here uh, in the frames, uh, they are all blue because the ASCII characters do not span uh, the full 20, uh, 256 values of, uh, of the bytes. Uh, so they are all bluish, uh, printable ASCII characters, and uh, these darker zones are spaces. So you can even figure out the layout between the three paragraphs here. You can see the first, second, and third paragraph. And this is actual data being transmitted between padding messages. Well, Tianwen-1 is our favorite spacecraft. Uh, why? It has a really huge signal, uh, much stronger than the other ones. As uh, said, uh, even with the 60 centimeter uh, dish, you can really dis receive it and pick up the data set bands uh, these days. It perhaps transmits more varied and interesting telemetry uh, than the other spacecrafts. And it's also perhaps it's easier to, to understand uh, for us without any previous knowledge about the format of this data. And uh, maybe the lack of public information makes guessing these kinds of things a much more attractive challenge for us. Our first uh, huge success with Tianwen-1 was finding its orbit. As I said, uh, in contrast to the other two spacecraft, there was no publicly available orbit trajectory for Tianwen-1. So at the beginning of the mission, you can 
I'm aim your uh, small horn antenna towards the sky and pick up the signal, try to guess where in the sky it is. But if you want to pick the signal the next day and the next day, you really need to figure out the trajectory data to be able to figure out in advance where in the sky it's going to be. And if you want to point the dish at your garden or even more, uh, the 20 meter antenna at Bochum, which has a narrow beam width of one degree or so, you really need to be precise. So this all started uh, the very afternoon uh, after Tianwen Watch launched. Paul started to ask me, well, uh, my friend Ruth has found these numbers here. We can see the table of numbers in the telemetry from Tianwen 1. And Paul was asking me, well, uh, can they be some kind of star tracker data. Star tracker is some kind of sensor that spacecrafts use to orient themselves in, in deep space. And uh, I looked at this for a few minutes and say, well, this doesn't seem to be star tracker data. You know, star tracker data is typically six, uh, four numbers, but here we have six numbers. It doesn't really fit. But you know what? Uh, I think this could be actually coordinates for the position and velocity of the spacecraft. A few clues that led me uh, to this conclusion are, well, we have th two different uh, types of numbers. We have these, uh, here, uh, these uh, three columns, which are large values. Uh, these columns, which are uh, small values. Of course, uh, these are six values, how they evolve uh, over time. If we go and subtract these three numbers from these three numbers, we get something which is uh, pretty close to 32 times these things. So maybe this is position, maybe this is velocity, and something like kilometers, kilometers per second. And maybe these measurements are uh, spaced 30 seconds apart. So everything started to, to make sense and, and to form into our heads. How can we figure out more about these things? Well, uh, if we calculate the magnitude of this vector, you know, your Pythagoras theorem, you get the distance from the origin in this specific coordinate frame. And this worked out to be close to one astronomical unit. This is the sun uh, towards a distance. So maybe the origin, the 0, 0, 0 coordinate is the sun. And uh, this is something which is pretty close to Earth. And we can try to plot the position. And in here, uh, there's a little bit uh, of different choices for the coordinate frames. But in some of them, it is pretty close to Earth, as you would expect of uh, one spacecraft which was recently launched. Uh, there's no tricks in, in this. These are the uh, six uh, different numbers, floating point numbers in the telemetry frames. And these are timestamps. Timestamps are quite important because without accurate timestamps, it's very difficult uh, to make use of its data. Uh, the timestamps originally, we thought they look like uh, this. It's easy to, in hexadecimal, it's easy to figure out uh, the units because you subtract uh, two of them. You know the difference should be 32 seconds. So, well, it's a counter in units of this. 0.1 milliseconds, which knows, which seems reasonable. But when does this counter start? What is the epoch of the timestamp? And uh, from our guessings, we were able to estimate this epoch, which is really, really weird. It doesn't make any sense for anyone to choose that as the epoch. A few days later, we uh, realized that there was some data before before these uh, 32 bit numbers, which at the start was just 0, 1, 4F. Uh, so we thought, well, static data of some sorts. But suddenly, after a few days, we saw this uh, increase to 0, 1, 5, 0, and then we realized, well, this is part of the timestamp. When uh, we came to that conclusion, uh, our epoch estimate was pretty close to this uh, epoch which is actually Beijing time. Uh, all Chinese spacecraft uh, missions, we, 
you use Beijing time instead of UTC. So this is Beijing time for uh, the beginning of 2016. That totally makes sense and it allowed us to use the trajectory data. Uh, the way to do, we do this is using GMAT, which is some open source software from NASA. And we use the position and velocity to calculate the trajectory and plot the future trajectory. Uh, this doesn't take into account any correction burns, uh, but we are uh, running our receiver in Bochum every day to watch out for changes in the trajectory and then pass the updates to uh, John Giorgini in JPL. This is uh, Tianwen-1's trajectory in uh, GMAT. You can see every month how the spacecraft approaches Mars until it arrives there at uh, February 10. And the last exciting thing I want to conclude my talk with is the deep space maneuver. So uh, from launch, the trajectory uh, of Tianwen-1 was, uh, was arriving close to Mars, but uh, actually 3 million kilometers away. This is close in the vastness of space, but you need to do a large correction to make your trajectory approach uh, closer to Mars. We already had seen a uh, small correction burns, some kind of tests of the propulsion in uh, beginning of August and end of September, but we were expecting a large correction burn soon enough. And this happened two days ago on Friday. It was uh, right at the, the end of the Chinese holidays, just after, as the media said, we are going to do this after the end of the holidays and just as clockwork, a perfect correction that now sends the spacecraft within 22,000 kilometers of Mars. This is uh, quite adequate to perform a mass orbit injection and enter mass orbit. And uh, this is the way it will look like uh, at February 10 without uh, any further corrections. There are two or three small corrections, but uh, things will look like this uh, with Tianwen-1 arriving to Mars. And this is the end of my talk. So I'll be giving the microphone back. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. That's really good. Um, what a fascinating story. Uh, <laughs> um, and some great puzzling and uh, decoding going on. It sounds a bit like cryptography, and I think that's fantastic. Um, there are a couple of questions. I'm only going to ask one because we're a little bit uh, short of time. Uh, and it comes from uh, Matjes uh, S59MZ. Uh, it says, are there any telemetry recordings available from Mars 2020 or others? that were used during your Mars decoding, mentioned in your blog. I searched your GitHub, but can't find any .wav files. I don't know if you could answer that then. Yes, yes, uh, so I think unfortunately not. The, there are two problems with these recordings. Uh, first of it is they are pretty large. And uh, second, uh, we have lots of recordings we've made at uh, Bochum, including this March 2020, uh, but for the time being, uh, they're not being publicly shared. Mm, you know, uh, AMSA DL is a large organization, so it takes a bit of organizational movement uh, to, to share these. Uh, hopefully, I'm now working with uh, the GNU radio team and SETI Institute uh, to use Allen Telescope Array, and uh, maybe we can do and record uh, some uh, signals uh, from Mars 2020. Also, there are other people uh, who have access to more or less large dish, dishes, like 4.5 meter uh, dishes, so maybe they would be kind enough to do and uh, share some Mars 2020 recorders. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Danny. Um, that's great. There are a couple more questions in the in the Q and A, which I'd ask you to uh, perhaps type a reply to, uh, Danny, if that's okay. Um, 
it's because we're a little bit we're just about to time but we're going to be a little bit over if uh, if we're not if we're not careful so round of applause for danny everybody thanks very much and i'm going to try this old uh, raffle thing again <laughs> I see one or two people clapping. I see one or two of the panelists clapping. I can't see the attendees. Let's try this again. Uh, it looks as if we've got action here now. Here's a list of uh, all the attendees and I can shuffle them. And you have to believe me that they appear on the edge of the wheel. Um, and uh, although you can't read it because it's too, because they're too small. <laughs> but I can assure you that they're there. Um, and I'm now gonna spin the wheel. And the first, the first prize is uh, a, um, an AMSAT UK polo shirt. Uh, so let's just give it a go. Well, congratulations, Stephen. I'm going to press the remove button now because we, the rules are no one can win two prizes, I'm afraid. Um, so that was the first prize. Uh, the second prize uh, for today, there will be others during each break, but we're doing two now because uh, we missed out the first one. And this is an AMSAC coffee mug. I won't bother showing you a picture, but it's really good. So there we are. Congratulations to those two winners. Uh, during the next break, we'll, uh, we'll have another go when uh, the prize is uh, a 2021 RSGB yearbook. And uh, I know that uh, both our um, at last winner, I'm not quite certain where ST2 is, but it sounds overseas. So hopefully we can send that through the, through the mail. Um, we're now just, uh, just about time, on time, I think. 12, 10 this both starts. So I'll pass over to Graham uh, to introduce our next speaker. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jim. That was wonderful. Um, I defy any other organization like, uh, I don't know, AMSAT NA or BATC, who I know have got um, uh, their own conventions and colloquiums and things, symposiums coming up to to beat your wheel of fortune for the, for the, for the raffle. I, I don't think that they stand a chance, but that, this is a challenge anyway. Um, and yes, I just uh, agree with your uh, uh, comments about Danny's presentation. I, I, I'm in awe every time I see a tweet or anything from uh, from Danny about what, what he's done or what they've discovered uh, and decoded. It's just marvelous. It's real citizen science and it's showing to me that amateur radio has got a real future, which is really good news. So uh, moving on now, um, we are coming closer to earth. Uh, our, our next speakers are talking about some CubeSat projects, which are obviously close to, close to our heart, uh, particularly as I believe um, that they've all got transponders on, which is rather nice to hear. Anyway, I won't steal, steal their thunder. Uh, David Greenberg, 4X1DG, who is our next speaker, our next presenter, is a member of the Israel Amateur Radio Club. Uh, he's been active on satellites since uh, days of Ox, Os, Oscar 10. Uh, and on most of the analog and digital satellites since also he plays with, I'm sure you don't play EME, but he, he does VHF EME. Uh, he's a radio communications in instructor at the Herzliya Science Center, working with high school students uh, to develop satellites. He's joined today by one of them, Yotam Rabin, whose call sign is 4X5YR. Uh, gentlemen, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hope, hopefully you can see the screen. Yep, perfect. Okay. 
Uh, so without further ado, I'll start. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Yotam Rabin, Forex 5 Yankee Romeo. I'm a 16-year-old RF engineer in the Teva and Rukhifat project. And today we'll talk a little bit about us, what we do here in the Herzliya Science Center. And, also, and we'll also later talk about the services that the Tevel satellites will provide to ham, ham operators from all over the world. David, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Sure, thank you very much, Yotam. <clears throat> As, as I was presenting before, 4X-ray 1, Delta Golf. Before that, I was 4X-ray 6, India Alpha. If any of you had the chance to communicate with me over some of the satellites, especially Oscar 40 at the time. I think that I was on Oscar 40 at, at the moment when the last time the transponder was on. Okay, Yotam, back to you. Thank you. Okay, so just a little bit about us. Uh, we are a group of high school students with ages ranging from mostly 14 to 18 years old. We have, <clears throat> we have already developed and successfully launched three satellites into space, Luchifat 1, 2, and 3. Uh, our students lead almost every part of the development operation of satellites, from software development, integration, ADCS, and of course, ground station and communication. Each student usually, <clears throat> each student usually specializes in one field or and one field, and later even teaches other students. Um, in, uh, <clears throat> in addition to leading every aspect of the technical challenges of operating of developing operating satellites, uh, we also we also lead uh, lead many other in many other fields. First of all, <clears throat> first of all, our development teams are led by students. We have a student directorate which leads the project, and also students lead the training of newer students and even participate in public relations. At course, almost like a company of high school students. And of course, there's the mentors who usually help us in training of new students and guiding us students doing our work. So our first satellite was the Duchifat One. It was the, it was the world's first uh, operational student-built satellite and was an Israel's first sat nanosatellite. This means that we're, first of all, in Israel, we are ahead of the, ahead of the space industry uh, in Israel and also ahead of many universities. Uh, also, also uh, the satellite had an onboard APRS decapitator for amateur use. Now, uh, for almost every satellite before it launch, it is launched. There's uh, you need to conduct some environmental testing. First of all, you have to make sure that the satellite can withstand the immense pressures of launch. So you uh, so you have to do a vibration test to make sure that your satellite can stand these uh, pressures. As you can see, these uh, these uh, uh, these uh, facilities in the Israeli space industry were built for far larger satellites, satellites that weighed a few tons. Uh, so it was extremely funny for us to see how these uh, how our tiny satellite fared, uh, 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 was tested on these uh, huge platforms. Uh, Duchifat One was launched from uh, from uh, from Russia on the Dnieper missile. This, mi this, missile, this missile is a repurposed uh, ballistic missile. And it, as you can see, it's, it's launched from the ground. Now, Duchifat-1 had functioned for, uh, for over four years and, uh, and, was uh, and amateur radio operators used it uh, uh, from all over the world. Um, despite, the, uh, the, despite that we expected it only to last about one year, uh, it, not only, so it not only operated one year, it operated almost five years. Uh, so the Fat One was a huge success, and on to Duchi Fat Two. Now Duchi Fat Two or Hupo, uh, we actually use the name Hupo because uh, European engineers couldn't pronounce the name Duchi Fat. So uh, it was part of the European Union's QB50 project. Uh, the project uh, mission was to measure, uh, was to study a uh, layer of the atmosphere, as I'm probably well, well you know it, the lower thermosphere. Uh, first of all, this satellite is an improvement from our last satellite, Duchifat One. It's a 2U satellite. Uh, sorry, uh, we were actually the only high school group in the entire project uh, that participated in it. The rest were mostly universities and other organizations. And other actually improvements uh, in the satellite that it had an ADCS system, uh, so, uh, which increased the complexity of our mission. Now, the, sat the satellite was launched from Cape Canaveral um, to the International Space Station. Our students actually went, uh, uh, went to the launch and, invited by, and were invited to the VIP room. It was an extremely exciting moment for us. 
after arriving to the ISS, uh, the satellite was, act was released uh, through a robotic arm. And as you can see here, it's actually, uh, we, uh, we actually managed, uh, the ISS actually, actually managed to capture a picture of a satellite, Hupo. It's extremely rare that you actually can uh, get a picture of your satellite in space. Uh, Hupo is the satellite on the right. On the right. Now, um, also, uh, you, a hugely uh, tense moment just uh, shortly after the release of the satellite into orbit is, wait, is the first pass and, and, waiting, uh, for, and waiting to see if the your actually satellite has survived the launch and is operational. Let's see if, if Hooper wants, uh, if Hooper survived the launch. As you can see, luckily enough, the satellite survived the launch and we, ha and we had communicated uh, with it on a da daily basis. Okay. Now, uh, because of the satellite's low orbit, only 400 kilometers, its orbit only lasted about a year and a half. Uh, so in addition to uh, of the planned 50 satellites in the QB50 project, only about 30 made it into space. And even fewer actually survived the launch. So Hoopon was not only one of the most successful satellites and provided huge amounts of data to European Union, it was also the last satellite to be fully operational. And on to, to our next satellite, Duhifa 3. As you can see, again, we have an improvement. It's a 3U satellite. Uh, it's the first satellite in the Tavel project. And uh, in addition to the satellites uh, having, again, an a a ADCS system, it also had an onboard camera. Its mission was to uh, research and photograph the Earth for ecological research for students from all around Israel. Now, we actually had uh, learned a lot of lessons from Duhifat 2 that we implemented in, uh, in uh, Duhifat 3. First of all, um, first of all uh, we, ha we had huge improvements in our ADCS system. Beca because uh, this time we actually needed to uh, photograph the Earth, first of all, we needed to be extremely precise with our orientation, and not, uh, uh, not only to take pictures of what we, where we wanted to, but also to, but also to actually take pictures at all, because uh, if it started to move too fast, it would be too blurry for us. And also another lesson learned from the, uh, one of the, <laughs> we learned a lot of lesson, but uh, another lesson was actually about ground station software. Uh, uh, in Duhifat 2, uh, to, uh, to manage data and commands, we used a program of the European Union called SES. But because we wanted to uh, uh, develop a program of our own that will also be able to use multiple ground stations from schools from all over Israel, we developed a, a program that was on par with, uh, on par with programs uh, uh, in the, leading in the industry. Uh, these are just some of the pictures captured from Duhifa 3 uh, that are being used for ecological research. Uh, uh, on the bottom, you can see a picture of the Himalayas uh, in Tibet near Lhasa. And this is uh, on the on the upper picture is uh, Lake Basar, I think, in Iraq. And on to you, David. Thank you very much, Yotam. I hope that everybody uh, appreciates what effort it is to use uh, for high school institution, high school students to work on a satellite project. Now we are going to talk about the uh, Tevel uh, satellite constellation. This is a constellation uh, of eight satellites that is about to be launched. Right now we think that this will happen in December 20. Okay, now the project itself is called Tevel that stands in Hebrew for students building satellites. I hope that you can appreciate that. What we see here is eight satellites. Each of the satellites is being assembled and software developed for it in a different high school across the country. It was decided to use our experience in our Celia Science Center to and bring together other high schools in the country to participate in space programs. Next. Yotam is uh, in control of the slides. And this is why I'm using it next. Okay. Actually, <clears throat> the, uh, to develop a satellite, okay, in an env environment like in high schools, and Yotam has 
emphasize the, the issue that these are high school satellites. It was, for me, it was a privilege to work with uh, high school students. Actually, they joined the program when they are very, very young students. I hope that you can appreciate it. I meet people like Yotam and younger, of course, they, that they start their first steps into radio communications and space. And it's really a privilege for me to see how they develop themselves from young guys into almost the uh, professional guys. Uh, our challenge here is to develop such capabilities in other schools across the country. And this is the purpose of the major purpose of uh, the project. This is an educational and ham radio project. Next. Okay, what we had to do in Ocelia is to, in, on top of what we do with our own students is also to prepare teachers of other high schools so that they can participate in teaching their students and working with, the, with them together to assemble the satellites, test the satellites, also develop software that has to be, to meet some criteria that were, were, were set in Ocelia. I see that uh, our major problem in the future will be to major manage the operation of eight satellites. Next. Okay, the, the mission of Tevel, as students building satellites to develop eight satellites in eight separate teams or schools we have independent software development and it was all had to be tested and to make sure that it meets our criteria. The uh, FM transponder is actually the only payload on these satellites. Beacon telemetry will be transmitted every 20 seconds. So it will be possible for ham radios around the world to uh, participating in receiving and also displaying the data that is contained in the beacon telemetry. All the uh, eight schools were interested in developing some kind of ground stations capabilities. Most of them don't have ham radio responsible for the operations over there. They don't have licenses. So Actually, we have our control station in Artelia that will be the major ground station, the control ground station, and maybe two other schools in the country that has, uh, have developed some students as ham radio operators. And also they have a license from the Minister of Communication. Next. Now, activities of ham radio in Ocelia uh, Space Laboratory. We have a club station for X-ray 4 hotels, uh, Sierra Charlie. This station is active in AGF, VHF, and UHF. We are communicating with other hams in the world and also use the station in order to teach what radio communications technology is all about and also prepare the students for the exams of the Minister of Communications. So most of them actually gain the, uh, uh, the, the call sign, of course, and, and the license from the ministry by the end of the uh, first, or two, uh, first year or two years in the program. We run also ground uh, station improvement project we have learned from experience that uh, in some uh, passes of the satellite, we lose uh, precious time because of uh, man-made uh, mistakes. And uh, we are trying to automate the operation in a way that all the uh, switching between antennas, amplifiers, transceivers and so on will be automatic. Another project uh, that I can mention is one that is related also to Daniel, the previous uh, talker. 
Uh, I had one guy, one uh, student, very, he was very young. I still remember the first day that we met by the whiteboard and I started to explain to him some principles of radio communications and he himself was so enthusiastic about uh, radio communication and started to learn and search the net and found out about uh, GNU radio and even contacted Daniel to help him to develop a, a system to communicate with our satellites. Next. Now each of the eight satellites is a one use satellite. Okay, it carries an FM transponder. transponder. Okay, this is the only payload. UHF uh, downlink and VHF uplink. You can see the frequencies published here. The, uh, it is similar to the, the one that the ISS carries and operated just recently. The major difference is the power, of course. We, in one use satellite, don't have capability to transmit uh, much power is on the ISS, so the power will be 0.5 watts, 27 dBm. Also, the beacon will be transmitting uh, 9600 bit per second, and the modulation will be uh, BPSK using AX25 well-known protocol to uh, ham radios. Next. Okay, now after the launch, I believe that our major problem will be to manage the operation of the FM transponders. This will be a major challenge that I can foresee. Uh, initially, all of the satellites, since they all will be launched on one missile, okay, and uh, released into orbit to, uh, together, we, I believe that most of them will have the same footprint. So only one FM repeater will be activated at a time. If over time, we'll see that there is a difference and it is possible to allow more than one transponder at a time, we of course will have to develop a plan to operate the other FM transponders. As I said before, the launch is expected at uh, December 20 on board SpaceX Falcon 9. Okay, I just hope that uh, the launch will be successful and would like to thank everybody for listening. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now there'll be time for questions. Uh, Jim, I think- Unmute, please. Yeah, I'm unmuted now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Yossam awesome. uh, and uh, David, that's a fantastic uh, story and um, some of it was uh, very reminiscent for me of uh, our Funcube experience, which I think was about seven years ago. Uh, and I've got one question from me before I go on to the, uh, another couple from the audience. And that is, um, I noticed that your first satellite was launched on the Dnepr rocket, I think. I wondered if you thought about going to watch the launch or not. Uh, of the Nieper rockets, um, I'm not, um, I don't, I don't remember if you actually went actually, to see the launch. Actually, this was before the time of me and your time. On yeah. The, oh, okay. The project. <laughs> so we were not there. I was interested because Funcube was uh, launched on a Dnieper rocket from, uh, I think it was Yasny, and uh, we were, we could have sent a couple of people to observe it. But we decided not to when we saw the uh, photographs of the road you had to get there during <laughs> the winter. It was pretty. It was pretty. Uh, uh, pretty terrible. Uh, I'm getting some nice, very nice comments from uh, a lot of people about your your lecture and also our previous speakers. So I won't acknowledge them uh, individually here, but thank you very much. But there is one question from Alexander Bars. Um, B A R Z is his surname. I'm not quite certain where it comes from because he doesn't have a call sign. And the question is this, do you need telemetry uploads to your dashboard or AMSAT SATNOX dashboards for all the SATs? Um, if I understood the question correctly, uh, yes, we do. It was of immense help to us actually in Buhifat 3. Um, we actually use this feature quite a lot. For example, uh, um, 
uh, it was an it was immensely important to us. For example, just uh, actually the first signal we actually received of a satellite was through Satnogs. It wasn't through. It was even before it reached uh, its pass over Israel. So uh, yeah, we do need telemetry uploads. Uh, if there's, for example, a problem with the satellites, we lo lose contact for some reason, then these telemetry uploads are extremely important for us. Uh, I know that we developed. Uh, our own uh, dashboard for Dukhifa uh, 3, uh, we hopefully will too for Tavel. Okay. Um, thanks very much. There's a, a question come in on um, our, our little chat as I'm monitoring it. Um, it says, uh, could you just give us a, bit, a few more details about the repeater on Dukhifa 3? Okay. I think, I think the question is, will it be switched on? <laughs> okay. The problem is that we, we 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 have tried to uh, switch it on a few times, okay, and uh, we have realized that we have a problem though. Uh, the data or idle data that is generated by the onboard computer was mixing with the audio from the receiver, okay. So we uh, instead of getting pure voice FM transmission we got a mixture that was wide band and what you could hear was only noise. Yeah, mostly noise. Unfortu uh, yeah, unfortunately, during the last attempt to test it, after we found our, our walk around it, uh, we have noticed that there is a, a very significant drift of frequency. And since then, we weren't able to, to communicate with the satellite. Uh, yeah, actually, I worked personally and also in the factory and in Teva, making sure that uh, this, this wouldn't happen again. Uh, uh, which, we, because we know the reason why it happened in uh, the three, we can be pretty certain that it won't happen in Teva, and the, the hopefully the FM transponder will be fully operational. That's great. Thanks very much. There's a, another question coming from Phil Kahn, uh, KA9Q from the uh, United States. And it's a fairly simple one. So what fraction of your students stayed with your project to completion? Hmm. Um, it means about, uh, by the time they join, by the time they leave? Yes. Well, uh, it really depends because first of all, we have, how we work is first of all, we have some basic training and then we go to more specialized training uh, that is done by um, in the different fields. So I'd say about uh, by the time you reach a special training, probably around 70% of people stay. Again, it's uh, <laughs> we're still high school students and some people have, uh, and it's still problematic for some people to develop satellites and study at the same time. But um, I think the people that do stay uh, do it because they, they love what they're doing. They're doing something that's probably one of a kind. And um, I don't know how I don't have really much more to say. No, okay, that's fine. Yeah, I I, I agree. We, we, um, most of us um, watching now are doing this because we have a passion for for space, and uh, I think that unites us all. I think, uh, and it's great to. It's very nice to see a new generation coming along, uh, Yotam and David. That's really good. Um, and there are a couple of questions uh, which probably need a bit of expansion on the Q and A box. If I could ask either one or both of you to. To have a look at that and perhaps type at the odd answer in that would be that would be really good because we ought to uh, we ought to keep things moving on. I'm quite keen to to keep the timetable. Um, a fascinating story from both of you. I do hope that maybe next year we'll be having a live event um, within the UK and maybe you could come and visit. It'd be very nice to uh, to meet you. This is not bad. This old Zoom business, but it's not quite the same as uh, looking people in the eye. That's, so thank, thank, thank you very thank much. Very much. Thank you. Um, we now come to uh, uh, raffle time, um, and the guy who won the last one, um, uh, no, no, not last one, the, the, the question, um, uh, whose surname was Bares, I guess it's Christian name now, he, he's from Germany, he tells me, so uh, that's okay. Let's just go to our, our uh, Wheel of Fortune, hope it hasn't stopped again. No, it looks okay. So we're, this prize now is for the uh, 2021 RSGB yearbook.
So he gets removed, so he can't win twice. Uh, and that's really good. He's in uh, uh, NM, I think it's uh, Scotland. So it does mean it would save us a bit of postage because the year looks quite heavy. <laughs> a sign of the practicalities. Um, it's now, what are we doing? It's now 5-2. We could have a two minute break, but I'll pass it back to Graham. And uh, Graham, either you, you might want to continue straight on or um, you might just want to have a pause uh, for a couple of minutes or a comfortably uh, quick cup of coffee make. Over to you, Graham. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, I think we should uh, try and stick to our agenda. Uh, we don't normally manage to stick to the agenda at AMSAC Colloquia, but uh, maybe this will be a special special year when we manage it. Uh, coming up next, uh, of course, is Peter, DB2, DB2OS. Uh, so yes, I wouldn't mind a quick uh, five minute uh, coffee break, or actually a four minute coffee break before Peter starts at the Ashetlis. Uh, scheduled hour of 12.40. Um, we'll have Peter and then a, then a tea break um, and, uh, uh, sorry, then, then a lunch break, I mean, and uh, then we will reassemble. Um, and actually, just to remind everybody that at the very end of the colloquium at about six o'clock UK time, uh, we'll have a sort of an open forum session. Uh, those that have been to the colloquium, colloquium in the past, uh, 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 We'll, we'll remember these uh, uh, very special late night e e evening events. So we're trying to re recreate a sat gate meeting um, uh, this evening online. I'm not sure it works uh, without Carlos in the GB4 fun uh, bus, but there we go. Anyway, enough. Uh, back at 12.40 for Peter.
world. Welcome back to uh, the MSAT UK Colloquium. Um, hope you've all managed to get a quick uh, drink in there. Uh, so the final session that we have scheduled for before our lunchtime uh, is Peter, uh, DB2OS, uh, from AMSAT, uh, AMSAT DL. Uh, I think that Peter has uh, attended almost all the AMSAT UK colloquium over the past uh, 30 plus years. He is, however, at least from where I'm sitting, as I said, still quite a young guy because he was born, he tells us, only in 1960. And like many of us, he was inspired at a very young age by the Apollo moon landings. He's an engineer, a communications engineer at a well-known German automotive supplier and has held an amateur radio license since 1979. Since 1983, he's been married to AMSAT DL. His activities have included being uh, an Oscar 10 command station, an Oscar 11 PAXAT gateway, being a member of the Oscar 13 design and integration team, the RS414 uh, design team for RUDAC2, the Oscar 40 design team where he was the manager, the launch uh, campaign manager, oh, I remember that. And most recently, of course, he's been the project leader for the first geostationary amateur radio satellite anywhere, Qatar Oscar 100, which has changed many, many things. So um, he's been AMSAT DL president also since early 2001. Um, so Peter, we always enjoy hearing your presentations and this year will be no exception. And as I, as I know that you're gonna be talking, of, uh, talking about something uh, really out of the ordinary. So can you tell us everything that you know about your latest project called Lunart? Yeah, hello everyone and thank you very much Graham for the <laughs> nice introduction. And so now let's see if this works. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to tell you something about what we call Lunart, which is uh, supposed to be a lunar amateur radio transponder. Um, and a communication platform on the large European lander, which we think our project can support communication and payload experiments. So now I'm clicking my button, but my, uh -huh, okay. And I have to use a different button to switch the, the slides. <laughs> the mouse didn't work, sorry. So, uh, yeah, what I'm now talking about, I think went viral a few weeks ago or maybe months ago. Normally we have a lot of projects, some projects we, we are not really can talk about so much, uh, but this one already went viral, but it's not the only one we are working on. But anyhow, so, but important is this part here, ideas for exploring, for exploring the moon with a large European lander. So what happened? Um, Recently, ESA put out a call and invited for ideas for such a mission. So the European Large Logistic Lander, EL3, is, is a lander which is prepared to deliver around 1.5 tons of payload to the moon. It's not exactly clear where they will go now. They may go to different places, so it's not only one mission, so they plan for a cadence of missions from the late 2020s into the 2030s. Well, we are almost in 2020, so definitely not in the next few years. So, and it is not supposed to be a one-shot mission. So there will be a few more missions, but as it says, the, the first EL3 mission is planned to be launched not before 2027. So, and then, hopefully every three years. Also what you see here on the screen is an artificial uh, uh, drawing made by some ESA artists. Even we don't know if it will exactly look like this. So this is something which really in the past changed a lot like the uh, skateway, which also looks different from what it was looking in the beginning. So, the EL3 spacecraft elements, so there are three basic elements. So there is a lander, 
a decent element called LDE. There is a cargo platform called PPE or CPE, and then basically this payload cargo area, which can take a mass of about roughly one and a half ton. It has a diameter of 4.5 meters, and it is roughly 2.5 meters high. Um, this element will already pro provide some very key points. We come to that later, which means night survival, power and thermal. Why is this so important? I will also show in a moment, but it is very critical. It is not so easy to put something on the moon and live there for a while. So, but this lander will also provide means of communications through internal gateways, direct communication to Earth, and so on. So what are the challenges? I call them fun facts. I mean, some of you, you already know, but I have to, everyone needs to be reminded that the temperatures on the moon can be very critical during the moon day and moon night. So. They can be down as much as minus 233 degrees Celsius, pretty cold. And it can be as hot as 123 degrees. So you will need some thermal, a good thermal design, not only thermal protection against the heat and the cold, but also to maintain temperatures over a period in, in the thing. So it's not so easy as it looks like. Um, yeah, the other fun fact indeed is the distance is around, yeah, somehow about th between 363 and 405,000 kilometers. So the distance, as you know, is varying, <laughs> but, and we know this from our satellite as well. So a signal to the moon will take up about, uh, yeah, roughly over a second, almost 1.3 seconds. And if you have a two-way communications before you get a reply from you, from the moon, you have to wait 2.5 minutes. If you go to Mars, this is a much longer period indeed. So, yeah, also very interesting point where people often get confused. Sometimes people speak about the dark side of the moon, probably inspired by some uh, comedy, scientific, sign, <laughs> scientific comedies, uh, science fiction comedies, maybe you know some of them probably. So there is indeed no dark side on the moon. Even the, the, the back side of the moon gets sunlight. So normally we speak about the near side and the far side. So the near side, that is the part side of the moon, which is always looking to, to the earth. And the far side is basically the back side of the Earth. Uh, in this animation, you can you can almost see that even the the back side, the far side of the Moon, is having day and night periods. So if you see here the Earth and how the Moon rotates around the Earth, you see that the the same face of the Moon is looking to the Earth, but like on Earth, you have a Moon and a day. So another interesting fact is it's not exactly the same side of the moon pointing to the earth. So we have some kind of lunar libration. You can see this here in this small animation, which is actually running over one month. So you see even here, the moon is not stable looking at the earth, rather stable. So. So in longitude and latitude, we have something about, yeah, let's say, between seven and eight degrees of liberation amplitude. There's a smaller one coming additional to that. But when you point antennas to the Earth or the other way around, uh, you have this kind of effect. So that means if you are using high gain antennas, uh, this has to be taken into account that you, either your beam width is not larger than roughly 10 degrees or that you have some sort of steering. So night and day on the moon, as you know, uh, 
the moon completes one rotation around the, the sun that is called the, the lunar day in the period of time, which is needed to complete one rotation. So then we have, as I explained before, we have this tidal locking. So the near side is always looking to the earth. So that means it takes, if you go to the details, you can go down to 27 earth days, seven hours, 43 minutes and 12 seconds it takes relative to the stars to complete one orbit or compared to the, the length of the lunar months on earth, this is in 29 days and 12 hours and 45, 44 minutes. So roughly that means every two weeks we have a lunar night taking two weeks of two weeks of lunar night and we have two weeks of lunar day. So as I told you in the beginning, this is pretty, pretty challenging because during the night, we call it night survival, you have no electricity from the solar cells, you have no warming from the sun, it's get extremely cold for two weeks. So you need something for that. And even how do you survive with having no power, no electricity from solar cells? Fortunately, this part we don't really have to worry about because that is something ESA will take care. So they have different ideas, different plans by isolation, by using some kind of fluid uh, cooling or heating. Even they are talking about uh, kind of nuclear uh, power source like on the Voyager probes uh, to power and heat the whole thing during the long lunar nights. What, but as I said, this is something they will take care about. We, because we are basically a hosted payload in some way. Something which is not clear is antenna pointing, even if we have a relatively wide beam antenna, when the lander lands on the moon, somehow we need to reorient and steering antenna at least once in direction of the earth. But as I say, it's pretty early at the moment. So only a few months ago, we learned about this lunar proposal. Actually, it was Matthias Bob, uh, with whom together we have created this proposal to ESA. Uh, I think it was two months ago or something like that when Matthias pointed out to me, hey, Peter, there is something interesting there. Sometimes you don't find really these things as you always need someone tell you, oh, have you seen that? Okay, oh no, I haven't seen it, but let's have a look. So we looked at it and we thought, okay, that is something we think we could do and why not try? So the ESA had an online platform where it, we could, or other parties could submit ideas for payloads, but also it was mainly for experimental, for scientific payloads, but we thought, okay, why not proposing such a communication platform uh, which we could provide? So the idea was we could support direct communication with Earth through amateur radio frequencies in the microwave bands, very like what we have already seen today, even uh, I mean, thanks to even thanks to uh, Q100 and all the mass probes and the work Danny, Achim, and all the others did show the people, hey, it's not really rocket science to be receiving signals in the microwave bands or transmit them. I mean, Q100 really show how easy it is nowadays with all this technology, with the SDRs and so on. So this is something even on microwave bands, which even an average amateur would be able to do. So what could we, what else could we do? We could support university and student payloads, very similar to other projects flying on the ISS or on CubeSats and so on. So we could provide an infrastructure that they could have direct access to the experiments. Indeed, still with the rules to follow uh, the amateur radio practice. So, and indeed it could also be a kind of backup communication link. So we 
think we can reuse a lot of things. We have already done a, a moon study a couple of years ago in 2009 and 2010, AMSAT DL together with the DLR, the German uh, well, space agency. We performed a study about flying a satellite to, to the moon, a moon mission, or even a Mars mission. And we already had plans here for kind of infrastructure where we could support even such a mission to Mars or Moon by providing communication backup links, or even when there are times, not so critical times, we could, it was even planned that we would take all the whole communication for such a Mars mission. And during critical times, the ESOC center would take over. So a lot of this infrastructure we have already well, I would not say design, but we have it already available, or at least we made those studies how it can be done. Uh, um, theory, about 10 minutes time, we should. Yeah, okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, no problem. <laughs> I try to speed up. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> Sorry, Peter, I do apologize. <laughs> no, no problem. Those who know my lectures, they know I, I usually tend to get over time. So, but I'm getting better online, it's easier. <laughs> Anyhow, so it has quite a relevance to the ESA program. And so our hope is really that we get in this first in this backup scenario, but also that we could support secondary missions from student universities which would probably not want to interfere with the ESA infrastructure. I will not go here into much of the details, but indeed we, we plan to have something uplink in the 2.4 gigahertz band, X band 10 gigahertz downlink, very similar to what we see on OSCO 100. We have the 20 meter dish antenna in Bochum available, but the idea is also what we call direct to home. So there's an idea to put in coherent S to X transponder. Our friends from AMSAT U8, OH, Finland, they already made a tremendous work during our P5A, well, design phase and when we were working on this project. So they have already designed some kind of hardware which could support such a mission. Indeed, the, some updates would be needed, but the theory is already there that it could be done. We also have ideas about having indeed also VHF and UHF, 145, 435 megahertz linear transponder, even long, even some sort of supporting missions on the surface of the moon by using all these proximity LoRa, 5G and BIoT protocols. So that for example, other experiments on the rover or something could communicate with our payload and then we relay to Earth. As I said, everything has to be open in the public indeed, following the ITU, IAU rules for what we are doing. Uh, another part is beacons. We, we plan or we think about having various beacons on this thing for radio science. So what happened so far in 29, May of 29, the call was opened in general. A couple of days before it was closed, the deadline was 3rd of July. I think it, uh, yeah, basically one day before we submitted our proposal. At the end of July, authors were notified of the initial idea evaluation. And for August, September, the step one first review outcomes were expected. You see there is a quite a complex process here for reviewing. They have a panel board. So they, they look at every details. I won't go too much into that. We are waiting now for, for the next step, what they call step two. So the step two is actually expected for September, October when they start with workshops. We are not yet there. Uh, there is some delay. I will show in a minute what is there, but you see it is a long process until step three, which is to be finished somehow in the middle of 2021 at the earliest. That is the pre, then when the pre-phase A studies will start. So what is the latest status? So actually our, our idea was got surprisingly interest. We saw 
almost 4,000 views on that page, probably a lot coming from the amateurs by, because this thing, even we did, as I'm that weird, we did not really got pub, bring it too much public in the beginning, but somehow it got to, to got there and it got went viral and we found a lot of interest actually in that. So there was a first response saying, dear Peter, thank you for the interesting idea submission. Amateur radio communication represents a very engaging way to involve our main stakeholders, European citizens in lunar exploration. It is a very inspiring idea. So I hope we will get further. Uh, as I said, things are a little bit delayed now because in the meanwhile, we got another message which was basically saying this was the largest response ever to a call of this type with 325 submissions. You, you can imagine this is a huge amount of work for them now to review. But anyhow, we already got our feedback, which looks positive. And from there, we are quite optimistic that we will hopefully get, go into the next step. And by saying so, uh, this is not a close thing to Europe. Even they say it is for the main stakeholders, European citizens, but even in our uh, proposal, which you can see online, we have notified that we are a worldwide community, that we are also seeking worldwide support. And when it comes to that, we will also look forward to work together with, with well, I'm that group, the satellite group, with university interested people worldwide. But we think it is a very exciting idea, very challenging still. But uh, yeah, I think we will see a lot of interest there. And uh, yeah, so fly me to the moon, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. We don't hear you, Graham. <laughs> Yeah, uh, very good, Peter. That's that's ah. excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And I made my time. Uh, you have. I mean, this is a record. What do you think by me? <laughs> Brilliant. That's excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you and, for being uh, part of. I don't know whether I can get spotlighted. Uh, oh, perhaps I am spotlighted. I'm not quite certain. Uh, anyway, here we go. Thank you. That's better. Thank you, um, Wouter. Uh, uh, there are a few questions, um, Peter. Um, the first one is from uh, Andy Thomas, uh, G0SFJ, and it reads like this. Peter, have ESA asked you if this project might interfere with their own communications with the lander? Um, well, we have not really seen any technical feedback yet, but we don't think that there will be any interference. There, there, by the way, thanks, Andy. He was also the one one of those who he was even there with his ideas before, and I think we could merge them easily together. By the way, yeah. but no, I don't really expect interference because this is something. I mean, we are close to the the band they they also will use, even so we are a little bit separated from that. So I don't think that we will interfere. There, there was some concern in the scientific community because when they want to do some survey from the back side of, well, the far side of the moon, I have to say, not the dark side, when they want to do some radio astronomy, they are fearing about interference from, from signals, but even that is, I think, can be minimized. And even if you go on, if you are on the far side, you need to relay satellite anyway. So some storm forward activities will, would have to take place there, but uh, yeah. There's another, uh, there's just one more question which I'll, I'll pose to you, Peter, if that's okay. And this is from Nitin, VU3TYG from India. It says, uh, Peter, based on the power budget calculations for the uplink, do the regulations from all ITU permit the power levels? And that that can be actually, I know in some countries, this could actually be a problem. I know because we have, we know that in some countries, uplink on 2.4 gigahertz is only limited to, I believe, a few hundred milliwatt or something like that. That could be indeed an issue in some cases. But nevertheless, we will have this 2.4, 10 gigahertz combination, but we also aim for having this VHF, UHF kind of transponder, which 
I hope in that case, there is no, not such a limitation in India, at least. Okay, very good. Thank you very much indeed, Peter, uh, for a great talk. And uh, as I say to everybody, at least more or less everybody, I think uh, if we can make a face-to-face a -face next year, it would be really good. But thank you I very so. much indeed for, for coming on today. And uh, I noticed we've got uh, 240 people watching on Zoom and I think about 180 or so on, on YouTube. So uh, we've got a bigger audience than uh, we have and a probably more international one, which is really good. So That's thanks great. very much, Peter. And uh, might see you at the uh, virtual SatGate meeting at six o'clock tonight. So at six oh, thank yeah. you. See you later. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> okay, um, there's, I'm going to do the raffle uh, in a minute, but there's one thing I want to do before that, and, uh, and that is to uh, say very many thanks to um, someone who you haven't seen, but who without, who's without, uh, without his efforts, it, this wouldn't really work, and that's uh, Ruta Wegler, PA3WEG. PA he's, uh, he's in the background there, and he's, he's pushing all the buttons and unmuting us and muting us. And uh, uh, there he is. <laughs> he's sitting at home in Delft. And over the last couple of weeks, he's turned his front room into a virtual BBC studio. So, uh, <laughs> yep. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> so, we're to thank very much indeed. Keep up the good work, but we'll let you off the hook after the Satgate meeting this evening. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> okay. Um, so, let's go and do this raffle then. Uh, this prize, or oh, this next prize, is for. Um, a uh no, this minute, cancel that um this next prize is for a fun q patch uh which looks like that if it's coming out mirror writing i'm i apologize um but we had about no, it's perfect jim it's perfect thanks thanks Greg. we had about a hundred of the it's it's actually mirror writing on my screen so i don't know quite what's going on it's zoom magic i think um this is a, a cloth woven patch we had about i think a couple of hundred made at the beginning of the uh Funky project, and this is this is one of three I've got left, so it's a fairly sort of uniqueish sort of thing. I did think about auctioning it on eBay as part of the cloak, but that just got a bit too difficult. Uh, so let's get the wheel of fortune up. And give it a spin. Okay, so we'll just remove him, increasing everybody's chances. Um, well done, Andre. Um, uh, congratulations, and uh, uh, you'll be hearing from us. I do hope you're logged in to the Zoom to be eligible for the prize. It doesn't have to be now, but sometime during the day is, uh, is part of the rules. Um, so that brings us on to lunch. So I'll just pass it back to Graham to, uh, to make the lunch announcement, Graham. You're muted. Now I really am unmuted. Yeah, that was a bit of a shock. I was expecting you to take us through through to the lunch break. But anyway, Jim, thank you very much indeed for your for your wonderful Wheel of Fortune invention again. And uh, congratulations to the winner who is in who is in Belarus, I think. But uh, um, no doubt you'll be able to get the patch out to him quite easily. So good. Uh, we're back at uh, two o'clock uh, to start with uh, Phil Ashby um, as our next uh, presentation. But I think actually we're going to be doing, am I correct, Jim? We're going to be doing the award for the uh, competition that we've had running uh, that David is going to. Yeah. I think that's it uh, scheduled. Yeah. I think we're going to do that uh, immediately before um, Phil's presentation, about five yeah. to two. Oh, okay. okay. 
Well, we'll do. We'll start at two, I think, and then I'm sure Phil okay. can speed up. We'll go, put him into well, overdrive. Yeah, Phil okay. says yes. Okay, so we'll 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 re, we'll um, regather uh, f uh, at two o'clock. So please go and have uh, your usual beverage and food that we have at the colloquium in at, uh, lunchtime. Uh, and thank you to all the speakers this morning, and thank you to everybody who's been watching uh, around the world. It's really a, a, a wonderful international event. And we're very grateful. Thank you very much.
Well, welcome back to the afternoon set part of the afternoon session part of the AMSAT UK colloquium. Hope everyone enjoyed this morning and has had a good, decent lunch, but not so much that they'll drop off to sleep this afternoon because we've got some exciting presentations uh, to follow. Uh, but before we start, the first presentation is from Phil. Uh, Phil Ashby talking about a funky software. But before we go there, we've got a special extra item. Is uh, I'd like to go to uh, David uh, David Bowman, G Zero MRF, who's going to give us the results and awards from the AMSAT QSO party that's been running on satellites for the last couple of months. And in doing so, I'd also like to particularly thank. Uh, uh, Peter, 2M0SQL, um, who was instrumental in helping get all this uh, system set up and writing lots of code, and who is, I believe, watching the show. So, uh, David, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Graham. Uh, hopefully this is all okay. Um, yeah, so as Graham was saying, the AMSAT UK Oscar Satellite QSO Party uh, was designed primarily to promote and encourage the use of amateur radio satellites. And uh, it was an idea of uh, Peter's uh, uh, two mic zero SQL. If we have a look at these couple of slides, um, we can see uh, the details and, and the results. So just uh, start this one. Okay, so uh, running for a period, as uh, Graham mentioned, of about seven weeks um, throughout the months of August and into September, uh, anyone who made a satellite QSO could upload their log and would be awarded points for each, uh, each contact. Uh, usually this was just one point per contact, but there were some multipliers involved for uh, operating a LEO sat over 7,000 kilometers um, or working some of the sats that we felt needed a little bit more activity. Um, with a first prize of £250 uh, in the form of an Amazon voucher, uh, the QSO party has been a really good success uh, with 86 stations uploading logs and many more being involved in the QSOs. Uh, overall, there was in, there was, uh, in excess of 29,000 QSOs uh, in the log when it closed. It's been really ple uh, pleasing to hear uh, late night passes over Europe with plenty of activity uh, rather than a solitary station uh, just calling CQ. So after a lot of hard work from the participants and some adjudication of the logs here, uh, let's take a look at the, uh, at the prize winners. So in first place, uh, well done to Vlad, uh, Romeo 9 Lima Radio, uh, who managed to accumulate 2,068 points uh, in the QSO party. Uh, Vlad, you are uh, the winner of the £250 uh, Amazon voucher. In second place, uh, we have Bernie, uh, Delta Lima 6, Italy Alpha November, uh, who certainly managed to find me a few times on Oscar 100 over the period. Uh, you win a £150 uh, Amazon voucher. And in third place, um, uh, Peter, Golf Zero, Alpha Bravo Italy, uh, with 1,632 points, only just a little bit behind uh, Bernie. So well done, and uh, a £50 Amazon voucher is on its way to you. Uh, the QSO party rules originally said that uh, from 4th to 13th place, uh, the people there would win a year's free subscription to AMSAT UK. Uh, because one of our AMSAT committee members, uh, Peter, uh, occupied uh, the 11th place, uh, we've added Denzel, uh, Papa Yankee 2 Hotel Zulu, to the subscription winners. So congratulations everyone for a truly international turnout and someone from AMSAT UK will be in touch with you by email during the next week uh, to arrange safe delivery of your voucher or to arrange your AMSAT subscription. Uh, well done everybody and thank you. Back to you, uh, Graham. Okay, David, that's amazing. 30, the best part of 30,000 QSOs in, in seven weeks, that's... Uh... That's quite an achievement. Uh, fascinating as well. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, next uh, is uh, Phil, uh, our next presenter is Phil Ashby. I have him down as two E zero IPX. 
I think he's also listed as M6 IPX, so he can explain the uh, confusion to us about that. Um, but Phil's been a, a Funcube software team member since the very start of, uh, of the project some nine, nine or 10 years ago. He, he describes himself as a recently retired technical architect, which is probably understating his role. But, um, and he describes himself as well as a troublemaker and a passionate enthusiast for whatever he works on. And I can vouch for that being true. He's going to provide us with a detailed update on his views about the Funky project so far. So that should be interesting. <clears throat> And uh, in particular, the ideas that we have for Funcube next. So, Phil, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Graeme. Um, right, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to leap straight into the old screen share. Uh, here we go. So, hopefully, people can see that one. Um, right. Okay, so this talk is um, largely non technical, um, which you'll be appreciating after a lunch. Um, I'm sure there'll be more technical stuff to come. Um, I want to cover a little bit about Funcube past, um, so that some of the lessons learned that we've had from previous missions. Um, I want to go uh, through our current thinking or what our, our present mission looks like, so that's Funcube present, and then a little bit more about uh, what that mission might uh, look like when it's implemented, so a bit about Funcube future. I realised when I was putting this together that that's the plot from A Christmas Carol by Mr Dickens, so apologies to Mr Dickens, I've stolen your plot. Um, right, let's dive straight in. Um, Funcube past. So this is what have we learned from doing Funcube for 11 years, I think it is, Graham. Um, we did an awful lot of stuff. Um, and uh, these are sort of some, some learning points I wanted to draw out because they're things that we wanted to address in our, in our, in our next missions. Um, so ambition paid off for us. Um, we thought we were biting off a lot. Um, we didn't think we were going to get everything done that we got done. Um, we made some fairly brave decisions and, and they seem to have paid off quite well. Uh, particularly, we do think we did things like using um, the FEC algorithm that's on AO40 on a very small processor. Um, it coped eventually with a bit of tuning. Um, the uh, transmission and scheduling algorithms that are built into the FunCube platform, the automated, the automation that we've got in there, uh, relieves ground crews of, of having to look after it as much. That's been quite successful. Um, we built in quite a lot of uh, recovery uh, and debug capability, uh, and that's proved really useful, um, sometimes not just for us, but for things that wear payloads on as well. Um, we chose to build our own ground segment, the dongle, the Funcube dongle, that's been uh, wildly successful, I think. Um, and we also chose to try and squeeze as much telemetry in as possible, and that's been really useful, as, as Graham alluded to earlier, people have been learning from that over many years. Um, so ambition paid off for us. Timing has been absolutely everything. Um, and timing applies at every scale as well. Um, everything from the phase of the clock, uh, your phase lock loops of synchronization, uh, the timing of watchdogs and the fact that watchdogs are a pain in the bum when you're trying to debug things, um, the exit timing from a launch from a pod, um, which caused us a serious bug. Uh, we might mention that in a minute. Um, Getting all your ducks in a row to achieve a launch um, is an interesting timing exercise as well. Um, and we had varying levels of pain doing those sorts of things. Um, one of the other parts about timing is the engagement that we get um, with the community and, and when we can engage the community. So one of the reasons I've, uh, I'm doing this now is to engage people early on what we're doing next with Funky, but what we can like to do next. Testing. Um, is also everything. It's as important as the timing. Um, we found a serious bug two years into testing Funky One. Um, admittedly, we had changed some other parts and they were side effects, but you know that was the point. Um, and leaping ahead a little bit to what I'm about to say next, um, as we want to involve our community more, the testing is going to become more important for us um, as something we want to be concentrating on with Funky next. Team size has been really important for us. We've worked in a small team and that's worked pretty well. We're a distributed team. Um, we get a certain amount done um, on our own, but we always find we work better when we come together, which we did uh, two or three times a year during the earlier development phases of Funcube. Um, we also get rather too many jelly babies, but yeah, we all survive. Um, documentation um, was a 
it matters. Um, it matters much more when you're working with multiple parties. Um, we discovered this with uh, when we were asked to, to, to be part of the UCube mission, um, particularly uh, at an early stage because their launch date came forward, ours went back. And we discovered whilst working with them that documentation didn't match. Uh, we had some things we had to work out on the fly with them. Um, so that caused us some entertaining, um, a loss of confidence perhaps is, uh, is a way of putting that. So documentation matters for us. Um, engagement with the community, engagement as operators of FunCube, engagement as developers of, um, of satellite technology has been limited. Um, and we'd like to do something about that. So what does FunCube present look like? What does our new mission look like um, that we're working on? Well, first of all, we want to do something new and ambitious. Um, the ambition paid off for us. We want to stick to that, um, that sort of plan, as it were. Um, doing something new is kind of what amateur radio is about. Um, there's no point in repeating ourselves too much, um, but we don't want to throw away all the good stuff that we've learned. Um, so things like the UV transponder, things like the existing telemetry is likely to remain um, uh, and help people with the investment they've made in, their, in processing and, and dealing with all of that. We want to address the engagement challenges that come with uh, doing something like satellite development. Um, and we definitely want to address documentation earlier than we have maybe have done in the past, um, allowing us to work more openly on documentation and in fact, the technology development um, of the platform that we're looking to build. We want to keep small teams because small teams keep things moving. And I said teams, plural. Um, we're working towards the idea of having a set of group of teams, a multi-party set of teams working um, together um, to produce an extensible platform and the experiments to execute upon it. And we're working in small teams with well-defined interfaces between them with good documentation between them. That supports parallel working, creation of experiments at the same time as the platform is being built. This is the core of the mission statement to build and launch an open space platform. So um, those words can mean different things to different people. Um, the important point about this is open and platform. Um, the space bit's kind of implied. Uh, so we're looking to um, use managed, modular and popular technologies. And I need to unpack that state sentence a little bit as well for people. Um, so management of technologies allows us to launch a platform where we haven't finished it, as it were. Um, there's hardware in space, but perhaps it's uncommitted. So there are other experiments to be run, um, but we can achieve launch approval with the managed components of the platform so we can meet the criteria of being able to shut off the radios, etc. cetera. Um, modular so that we have got clean interfaces between parts so that perhaps people can take the platform that we build and extend upon it physically or uh, in software terms and using popular technology and the idea of that is it lowers the barrier to entry so we use components which people can get hold of um, which aren't expensive uh, and they can work with quickly to get experiments up and running okay which gives me um, brings me to the last statement here which is our goal here is so that anyone can do experiments in space on the platform that we're designing and building. This is extending on our STEM ambitions. We were originally focused uh, particularly on schools being able to receive the telemetry the FunCube produces uh, and use it in educational um, scenarios. We're now looking at saying, okay, what about if individuals want to contribute something to space? Can we build a platform that lets somebody perhaps, you know, just write some Python and then we'll ship it to space and run it for them? Or whether an organization, maybe a research department from a university wants to take a platform as a starting point, uh, extend it with their own hardware uh, and launch that as their own mission. So those are extending that, um, that, that STEM ambition that we have. So that's our funky present mission. What would that look like as technology? Um, I'm gonna say we haven't been doing this very long. Um, we've been working kind of on thinking about the mission over several years. Uh, we brought it all together uh, a month or so ago. Um, and we've had a month or so of thinking, well, what does an extensible platform for space look like? So um, diagram number one, <laughs> courtesy of Jason, um, 
I'll do you a slightly larger version of it. In fact, if I pop over here, oops, no, not that one. Let me try that one. There we go. Um, so quickly, I'll talk you through this. This is um, an early sort of one month in architecture diagram for what the onboard compute might look like. There's a, an equivalent diagram for the radio subsystems that will probably possibly compose a fun cube next. Um, I haven't got a diagram for those yet. Um, we're still trying to draw, that, draw one of those. Um, but to take you through this diagram that you have here, um, there are common parts of existing CubeSats. There's uh, a definition for the CubeSat bus, um, which is on the bottom left and marked as a traditional bus. Um, that's largely in the electrical specification and a reasonably stable pinout of the uh, connectors that go inside the CubeSat. But there is some variation and you typically have to work with other teams to get those things to work together. Um, we want to uh, start from that point and work up the stack and generate more stable APIs, um, uh, more consistent protocols uh, for how parts communicate within the satellite. Um, attached to that is uh, the housekeeping processor in the, in the left-hand side. That's the traditional uh, compute component that's in the existing fun cube. Uh, we're choosing to run it on slightly more modern technology than 8-bit MCU these days. Um, that provides us with our management capability with the housekeeping features that we need to guarantee behavior to get a license to launch the process, to launch the satellite. Attached to that are various storage. We find that FRAM is quite useful as a transient store of non-volatile storage. Uh, and there's system flash in there to hold all of the application software and the housekeeping software to run it. Connected to that housekeeping processor is clock and power management components. Um, and this basically gives us on-off switches for other parts of the satellite um, and lets us control the power consumption of the thing. The new parts, the FunCube next area, is the rest of the diagram towards the middle and the right, where we choose to include popular application processors. And our initial thoughts in this direction are to choose two different types of technology, um, an STM32-based device, um, an ARM core-based device, which is very, very popular, there's lots of software development tools for it. Um, it's very easy to get hold of a dev kit for one of these things and go ahead with, uh, with writing code um, in multiple languages using multiple um, base core operating systems or kernels to run on that processor. Um, on the other side of the diagram is something a bit more interesting. We thought we'd do something a little bit, uh, a little bit different uh, and fly a risk v core. And the uh, process of choice for that, the SOC of choice for that at the moment, is, uh, is the K210 uh, platform. Again, dev kits are available. There's a community building up around this. Um, it's specifically targeted towards uh, signal processing and running, excuse me, um, Google TensorFlow inference engines. So we think that might be fun to run an inference engine in space. You can do things with, uh, with image processing, with audio processing, uh, with radio processing. Um, on those kinds of processes. So that's what we're thinking of flying as uncommitted application processes on, on, on the satellite. Connecting all that together is a separate FPGA that provides switching routing logic uh, of the various buses that are connected on the satellite. Um, and again, critically gives us uh, management over which parts of the satellite those application processes have access to at any one time. So we can, you know, we have an off switches for things which gives us some, um, you know, a control an ability to launch and be compliant with things. Down at the bottom right is a high-speed bus. Um, your traditional CubeSat bus can't really be declassed as high-speed. Um, you may be lucky if you get a megabit SPI over it. Um, the high-speed bus we're looking at is uh, much faster than that. We're looking at using some kind of LVDS um, organized uh, electrical system uh, and connecting in cameras, uh, radio systems directly for SDR on those application processors. Um, uh, and other such things, other sensors, uh, audio systems, vibration sensors attached to it, magnetometers, various things we can, we can possibly include in that architecture. Okay, um, that was a brief tour of the diagram. Um, we've got some constraints that we need to meet as well while we're doing this. Um, we need to remain compatible with some of those early emissions so that there isn't wasted investment. A lot of that's going to be taken care of in um, the existing housekeeping processing features. Um, we also uh, need to remain deployable as a subcomponent, a payload in other people's missions. Um, that was one of the first things we actually did with UCube. 
Um, that proved to be reasonably successful um, in helping actually debug UCube while so flying it. Um, so that's a constraint that we're trying to keep. Uh, not shown on here because this is only the onboard compute um, is how the radio subsystems integrate to this. They're largely on the traditional bus, um, which is where they should be. Uh, that means we can arbitrate access to radios, um, but potentially we can give direct access um, to modulators for baseband um, SDR purposes as well. We're working on um, 10 gigahertz radio subsystem. Um, it's early days for that. We've been talking about it uh, two or three weeks ago. Um, and the intention there is to provide an extensible component. Again, you don't have to take that um, if you only want UV, but we may want to fly a 10 gigahertz radio that's phase locked um, and provides uh, carriers in other bands as well. So that we can do inter-band inter, in, measurements um, over a lot, with, good, with a good accuracy. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go back and flip back to here. Um, so that's what we think it's going to look like at the moment. Again, it's very early days. Um, what do we do next? So this is far too many words on the slide, but um, these are our thoughts at the moment on um, where we want to go next. Um, we want to firm up those choices of uh, processes and work a lot interconnects on those commonality interconnect buses and specifically on the internal controls document and APIs that we need to allow people to be uh, to rely on uh, the, the interfaces they're going to have to sensors, telemetry, radio systems. We want to work 100% in the open if we can. Um, we're looking at doing all of that documentation development on perhaps GitHub uh, or another um, social uh, platform of similar nature, perhaps the Atlassian platform or something, but um, that's the intention. Um, we're going to try and be API led with this work. So rather than going and building hardware in a dark room and then coming out and saying, so here's some hardware, um, we want to try and get that documentation done, agreed. Um, and that empowers those smaller teams to get on and work on that stuff. It's our responsibility as FunCube AMSAT to gain launch approval of the design. Um, I don't know if we've spoken to anybody about doing uh, a run, run, run your code in space, but we haven't written it yet, but can we launch it? I don't know if we've actually spoken to anybody about that yet. And we obviously have to develop the uh, the core platform um, to actually run that code on. Um, we're endeavoring to uh, get that platform technology development done as openly as we can as well, and very particularly to ship uh, FlatSats as testing environments so people writing experiments to go on that platform have got the real thing to run it on. And we can gain a lot of confidence from that. As experimenters, um, those other teams that we'd like to work with, um, obviously go away and design the experiments, um, bring ideas to the table, um, go play with the dev kits for the application processes, um, as and when the FunCube Next flat site is available, come play with that as well. Uh, engage with us via our um, open platforms. So we hope we probably GitHub, I'm gonna say GitHub, but it might change. Um, we'll see what we can, uh, we can, we can do, um, but mostly have fun. And that's what I want you to say. Um, there's a bit about me on here for when you look at the slides later. That's boring. Questions, if we have any. That's great, uh, Phil. Thanks very much indeed for that. Um, it's bringing back, I'm not um, very involved in FunCube Next, um, uh, but I was highly involved with, uh, with the original FunCube and uh, it sounds as like if things are, are really marching on. There are a couple of questions which I'm going to pose. I want to do one, one, one of, of myself. It's one I get asked from me. It's one I get asked quite, a, not quite a lot, but occasionally someone emails me or comes up at a, not so much meeting now because we haven't been having meetings, but uh, previously, I, I say, and they're very sincere. I really want to get involved. How do I get involved? What should I do? Who do I, do I apply to? What would your answer be? Mm, um... I would point people, I don't know about pointing people at you and Graham. Um, I think we we need to improve that part of the flow, that part of the engagement process. That's why I think it's useful to have something like GitHub where people can come along with an idea and say, look, I'd love to do this. Um, and they're on a level playing field with everybody else. Um, people who want to get involved with the with the FunCube team, um, 
yeah we we're all everybody can see who we are um come speak to anybody uh we have regular conversations um on a weekly basis um we're more than happy to have people join that conversation and see where they can help out uh, with that constraint that we don't end up trying to organize an enormous committee that's a, that's a, that's quite a good answer i must say i find it very difficult to answer that question uh, the other one i get asked sometimes uh, is how do i make a uh, how do i make a microset <laughs> and that's impossible to answer uh, okay, here are a few questions from the Q&A uh, window, Phil, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Phil, are you happy with the amount of volunteers that join the team, or are you short of volunteers altogether? Thanks, Manuel, 9H1GW, who I think is in Malta. Um, I think we're happy with the volunteers, but I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that we've, we've not actively tried to change the people that do things. Um, it's quite a commitment. Um, so I think it's good to have a conversation with somebody about how committed they can be and try and be honest about that um, before they, they commit to actually do it, being part of a, of a team like that. Um, but bringing in other people's expertise and, and previous experience is always valuable. Yeah. Okay. Walter says you'd like to answer this question live. You said that, sorry. <laughs> Walter's put a note on here, says we'd like to answer this question live. Uh, Did I, you want I to intercept anything about it? <laughs> okay. Um, no, it's gone. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next question then. Um, this is from Andre. Oh dear. Difficult surname. Uh, Andre Anu. Um, he's the guy who won the Fun Cube uh, patch, so he's perhaps got an interest. Uh, Phil, I have two questions. I'll ask them separately. As far as I understand it, every processing unit is located on a separate PCB. Am I right? Don't not possibly not the first two. We want to squeeze as much as we can on a board. Um, so we think we can get one of each on with the housekeeping processor. But the intention of those extensible buses, those high speed buses and interconnects is that it's modular, stackable, so we can add more. OK, and his second question is, if I'm reading it correctly, because it gets a bit technical, uh, is base OS, I suppose so, in brackets, based on some RTOS, e.g. free RTOS, or, or GNU Linux, e.g. Debian, with a preempt hyphen RT extensions, or is it completely bare metal? I'm not certain if I understand that question. I hope you do. Andre, you're in my world. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, so we are not going to try and put any constraints on people for that. So we're, we're, we're allowing access to bare metal for the application processes. That's the intention. So people can bring whatever they're comfortable with. Uh, we will have a sensible size constraint. So if, you're, if your entire application is 80 megs, unlikely to be able to push that up to space, um, but one meg probably be fine. Um, at the moment, we're looking at free RTOS for the housekeeping processor. Previous fun cubes, it was bare metal because it was an 8-bit MCU and we didn't want to get involved with, uh, with anything terribly complicated on there. Um, we're choosing to look at free RTOS now for um, for some sensible thread management and some well-tested semaphores and things um, on the housekeeping processor. But on the application processes, whatever works for you. Um, don't think I don't think you'll ship a Linux core um, kernel in, in, in within the size constraints. Okay, Phil, so I think that's answered the question. There is another one about the Funcube dongle, which which uh, Graham. He's going to provide a, uh, a written answer to. Okay, there. thanks, Graham. Um, I noticed one there's from Steve as well from M0, M0 MOI. Um, image processing. Yeah, we're intending to fly, and this is really early days, but we're intending to fly a pair of cameras, one on each end of the uh, of, of, of the uh, of the satellite. Um, we have things we'd like to do with those. I'm sure there are many things other people would like to do with those as well. Stabilized, um, I don't think so. Um, depends what you mean by stabilised, Steve. Possibly doing image stabilising is an interesting experiment to run. Okay, Phil, so I think that's um, all the questions done. So um, without further ado, I thank you on behalf of all our listeners uh, very much indeed for your presentation. Uh, it's really great to know that Funcube's uh, alive and well and uh, coming up for Funcube next. I think that's brilliant. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so I noticed that we're up to, well, we peaked at 260 attendees uh, just after lunch, which is good. I thought it might drop off. 
So to keep your interest going, folks, here is the next raffle. Oh, not another raffle, Jim. Not another raffle, afraid so. And just to keep your surprise for this spin, uh, which is, it's not a hugely sort of uh, brilliant rig, but uh, it's a little sort of handy talker type thing, but uh, I think it's fairly new from Martin Lynch. Uh, so if I can just stop sharing that and I'll get the wheel up. The wheel of fortune, hope it hasn't crashed. I think it has. Someone suggested that I use Firefox, but I haven't got Firefox on this computer, unfortunately. No, that's crashed. Look, we'll do a double, we'll do a double take uh, next break. I just, I just, oh, unless I can try reloading it, let's just see, it might just go. I'm looking at this little thing here. And that's another Wheel of Fortune. Huh. It's interesting, the uh, exit pages. I'll, I'll, I'll stop that for the time being, and we'll, we'll do two on, on the next break. We'll do two spins. I'll reload it uh, during the next speaker. So over to you, Graham. Thank you, Jim. That's uh, real technology as it's happening. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not going to get you to... Uh... Bit, more vol bit more volume, Graham. Ah, okay, like that. That's better. That's better. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Um, okay, is that better? That's better. That's fine. Okay. Um, thanks, Jim. I'm not going to get you to promote any products if <laughs> your description of that radio was was rather good. Um, yeah, uh, there was a question raised about uh, funky dongles being available or repair repair of them. Uh, sadly, we've rather lost touch of uh, with. Uh, uh, the the inventor um, uh, Howard and I, I'm not sure I can give much advice. Obviously, if you bought them through one of the retailers, uh, get get in touch with them. Um, but I don't think there's a, a repair service uh, generally available at the moment. Uh, okay, so on to the next on to the next presentation, which is Mike Mike Willis and uh, uh, G0MJW is going to be giving us a demonstration of Oscar 100. Uh, Mike was first licensed in 1983, uh, is interested in the technical side of the hobby rather than just operating, mainly active on VHF, and he claims to be a reformed contester. Um, not sure what that means either. Anyway, he's been an active member of AMSAT UK for many years, also, of course, the BATC and the infamous or famous uh, Harwell Amateur Radio Club. Mike's been uh, instrumental in the development of what is known as the potty. That, that's the uh, dual band dish feed uh, that so many uh, uh, that is designed for use with Oscar 100 uh, and many hundreds, maybe thousands now are in use. So a big thanks uh, to you, Mike, for your efforts on this and for some of the other developments that you're carrying on doing. Anyway, uh, Mike, the floor is yours. OK, thank you, Graham. Hopefully at some point you'll be able to see me. I can't see myself on the uh, on the screen at the moment, but it sounds like it's working. Uh, in the background, uh, there should be uh, QO100. And the idea about this is to give a yeah. demo. There's a little bit. It's, of... all, it's all good. Carry on. Yep. But uh, before I do that, and I have a video just in case, uh, which is probably a better thing to show, um, I'm going to do a quick uh, presentation. So hopefully you've now got the PowerPoint screen up. Um, yep. So, QO100 SHL2 demo, here we go. Maybe. Right, double click. So, what is QO100 is the first question. So it's a geostationary telecom satellite. Uh, it's designed to provide television and internet services over the, uh, the Middle East. It's located at 26 degrees east. But the good thing is it's got some amateur radio transponders on it. And that's the exciting bit. And those were an absolutely astonishing gift uh, by, uh, by Qatar to amateurs. Uh, it's the first time we've had access to a geostationary satellite, at least first time we've legitimately had access to a geostationary satellite. And in practice, that means we can communicate with other amateurs in the coverage area via the transponder 24-7, 365. So, I mean, that's, that's really good compared to uh, the very small duration that you get with the LEO satellites. Um, what type of transponder is it? It's a bent pipe transponder. So it relays on about 10.5 gigahertz, whatever it receives on 2.4 gigahertz. 
And if you're interested in looking at it and you haven't yet set up a receiver, there are two excellent um, web pages available, uh, both provided by the BATC, but sponsored by other organizations, AMSAT UK, AMSAT DL, uh, the Qatari Amateur Radio Society, and of course, Goonhilly Earth Station, uh, who are providing the, uh, the dish and a lot of the bandwidth. Um, so you can listen to the SSB CW QSOs on the narrowband transponder, or you can uh, look at the spectrum, at least, of the wideband transponder, and uh, there's a chat there so you can talk to each other. So uh, that's what we've got. Now, in terms of coverage, coverage is a third of the world, pretty much. It doesn't quite cover the North Pole. It doesn't quite cover the South Pole, but aren't there many amateurs up there, so that's not a major problem. Uh, what it doesn't cover is... Uh, the United States or Australia or Japan. So um, it's all those parts of the earth that are visible from 26 degrees east. Uh, and that visualization there that you can see is a good idea of that. So you can see the UK up in the top. We've got a good, uh, a good look at it. Uh, Iceland as well, then down to Antarctica on the south. India, get a good look into it. And also South America, Brazil. So quite a lot of um, Quite a lot of people can see it. It's a large proportion of the world's population, but it doesn't cover everybody. So that's something we need to maybe address next time. But what do you need to receive it? Uh, well, on receive, um, the dish has to be something that's maybe 45 centimeters or more. Um, you can use a larger dish, but the, there are diminishing returns above 1.2 meters because you start seeing the transponder noise floor. Um, a satellite LMB is the ideal thing to use. And it doesn't even have to be modified these days. Um, the, uh, the IF uh, is about 739 megahertz and the standard uh, satellite LMB. And uh, Simon's wonderful software uh, deals with all the drift and stability. But it does really need to be a PLL-based LMB if you can manage it. And on transmit, you need uh, a dish or Yagi. Um, it can be the same as the, as the received dish, of course. Uh, you need some way of generating a 2.4 gigahertz signal source, which could be a transverter and a normal radio, or it could be a software-defined radio. You need a power amplifier. Uh, the amount of power you need depends on the size of your antenna, but for SSB, 5 watts or so is enough uh, for, for a 60 centimeter dish. And the, uh, the images on the side there are the various bits and pieces. So we've got the, uh, the Octagon LNB, Funcube dongle perhaps, is an SDR receiver. The AMSAT DL up converter, um, the um, uh, uh, German, I think it's German, I'm not sure actually, uh, amplifier, and uh, in the far corner, uh, obscured by me, I suspect, in the image, uh, is the is the potty antenna. So that that's what you need. And here's what I'm using today. So um, I'm using an Adlan Pluto, which is a, a software-defined radio. Uh, I'm using SDR console as the software that's, that, that's driving all of this. Uh, I have a frequency reference. You don't have to have one of those, but I like to have one of those. So that's a GPS locked frequency reference to lock my LNB oscillator. So it's approximately on frequency. Um, a 50 watt 2.4 gigahertz PA, that's overkill for SSB, but it's the sort of thing you need for digital television. Uh, a 2.4 meter dish, again, that's overkill, but I happen to have one. Um, and uh, a dual band feed and uh, a hacked LNB. So my, in my, the case of my LNB, I cut it in half and uh, cut the horn off and fitted it to the back of the, uh, the potty antenna. And that's an earlier iteration of the potty antenna using an elliptical patch rather than a square, but it's basically the same thing. So that's uh, the sort of stuff you need for this uh, satellite. And finally, before we, uh, we start looking at it, um, it's always very important to respect the band plan. Um, we must pay attention to the band plan. And in terms of the narrowband transponder, it's now 500 kilohertz wide, which is great. Please don't go outside those levels and please don't transmit at signal levels higher than the beacon. Uh, but within those, uh, within those constraints, we have the, the QHO 100 transponder. So what I'm gonna do now or attempt to do is show you just QHO 100 live and turn on the sound. And if anyone can hear that, if you can hear that, maybe wave, good, yeah. So I'm on, uh, at the moment, 0 0.780, which is the standard frequency of the AMSAT UK net. If I now uh, were to transmit and say CQ AMSAT or something like that, someone would come, would come back to me, perhaps, I don't know. Um, 
I don't know if anyone wants to call there and we'll see if we can hear them uh, and, uh, and perhaps turn them in, just say hello maybe. Doesn't look like anyone's paying attention. Oh yeah, here we go. So there you go. You see, I didn't catch those because the audio level is a bit low here, but uh, great to hear you, uh, G0MJW. I'm going to go back to the demonstration, though, uh, because uh, what I'd like to do is play a video, which is a little bit easier to see what's going on. So uh, 7.3 for the moment, and uh, we'll be on later. G0 Mike, Juliet Whiskey. Now, what you might have noticed there, there's a bit of a delay, and um, that uh, is... Uh, is because the satellite is so far away. There's about a, a quarter second delay or so. So hopefully, and I don't know if this is going to work, uh, we'll go back to the presentation and click on the next slide. Click there. One of the fundamental rules of presenting is never to do a live demo. I'm going to try and do Ooh. Echo, echo. Yeah, let me just um, solve that problem. Do that. But just in case it doesn't work, here's one that I recorded earlier. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. CQ AMSAT UK Net. This is Golf Zero Mike, Juliet Whiskey. Golf Zero Mike, Juliet Whiskey. He calling for the AMSAT UK Net on QO 100. Mike, Juliet, Whiskey. Uh, this is Golf Zero, Mike, Romeo, Foxtrot, G0, MRF. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Dave. Uh, David, nice to hear you. G0, MRF, G0, MJW. Uh, anyone else for the net? For the net? Uh, we established a net, and it was quite interesting to note that there was a delay on the satellite link. And you can hear that delay by my voice coming back after I stopped transmitting. And that delay is something that we experience on geostationary satellites that we don't tend to experience on the LEO satellite. Uh, you are heard from uh, Golf Zero, Mike Romeo Fox. Uh, I guess, okay, well, a little quiet up, uh, up here uh, today. I noticed on the uh, forum there was a, a note that Alpha Uniform 2 Delta X-ray was active yesterday. I think that must have been the station responsible for a bit of a, bit of a pile up uh, just below the uh, middle beacon uh, when I tuned in yesterday morning. I think it's uh, a de expedition from India uh, going off to uh, an island. I quickly looked it up on qrz.com, so um, they, they seem to have been using HF, and there was quite a team of people there as well. So a bit of operation on Oscar 100 and then presumably back to the HF band. It's only active this weekend. I think they're closing down at the end of today. SSB isn't the only mode you can use on QO100. One of the most exciting new modes is digital television. Why would I? No, actually, I tell a lie. I have got a LED light ring coming for the camera, which is up here. So I'm using a, um, a Tatio webcam. Oh yeah. That yeah. is the camera someone gave me because they broken the SD card slot, but when you plug it into a um, PC via UZ, you get a menu option, and it basically says, uh, it says PC camera, so that's what I'm using. We're uh, one minute early. I'm uh, the thin controller tonight, as uh, Dave GKQ is um, doing video production for a WI online cooking course, and uh, so he's uh, he's asked me to uh, step in and uh, and do net controller for the night. So uh, welcome everybody after what has been a pretty uh, horrendous day here. I don't know what it's been like uh, with the rest of you, but, uh, and I suspect that's one of the reasons why my signal isn't as good as it could be. Oh, so that's QO one hundred. I hope to hear and maybe see you on the satellite.
Okay, so um, hopefully I've still got my audio back. Uh, at this point, maybe uh, we can uh, go to the questions. Let me turn you up again. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, I think I'm, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, great, okay. Yeah, there are a few questions in. Um, let's just go through them. Um, there's one from Phil Kahn, uh, K9Q, uh, which reads, how often do the 2.4 gigahertz uplinks uh, to QO100 QRM local Wi-Fi networks? Mm, good question. Well, it depends if they're on channel one, doesn't it? And how much power you're transmitting. Um, initially, I had a huge amount of trouble with that, uh, but I moved to channel 11 and it all went away. So uh, I think it can be an issue sometimes if you're transmitting high power. I don't think it's usually an issue if you're not transmitting high power. But if you're sending a broadband uh, signal, then it, you can cause QRM, yeah. Okay. And there's another question from um, uh, uh, Raymond, Raymond Fox, M0RFX. To receive, can I mount on a sky dish alongside the sky LNB? Or isn't there enough space being only two degrees different between the satellites? Presumably, t transmit would interfere with sky reception. Uh, yeah, well, it depends how big your dish is, really. If, if it's a small dish, then you might get away with it. If it's a very small dish, you might find you don't actually have to move it. You can actually see the transponder uh, on, off the side of things. But if you've got a reasonable sized dish uh, where you've got a longer boom, then you've got more space to put the two, uh, two things apart. Uh, but they're very close together, two and a, well, 2.8 degrees, something like that, three degrees. So putting two LMBs next to each other, they do get quite close. So one of them's going to be optimum, the other one isn't. But it's possible, yeah. Okay. Of course, um, nobody can tell the difference between a sky dish and a QO100 dish. So you can get away with this, with people not complaining that you're putting up a, a satellite. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay, um, that's all the questions we've got, Mike. Um, thank you very much indeed for doing uh, the presentation. It's really interesting. And I know you've gone to a lot of trouble uh, to, to get the audio and the video right. And I do like the bit about the guy on TV taking a photograph of his camera with his phone, turning it round and showing you his camera. I think that's brilliant. And I think yeah. that's been now sent round the world by courtesy of Zoom is quite an interesting thought. Yeah, he'll probably kill me for that, but there you go. Yeah. <laughs> no, right. Thanks very much indeed, and uh, we'll speak to you again soon, I, I hope. Thanks very much. Everyone clap. <laughs> okay, so now we'll do um, another, we'll, we'll try this old rattle spinning thing again. It seems to have come back to life without my doing anything, so let's scoot a try. So this first one, I'm doing two spins now. The first one is um, for the uh, uh, transceiver, FM transceiver, portable transceiver from a nameless um, source. Um, it's done it again. I don't want to have to do three. One go. Uh, Panic slowly, Jim. We've got a bit of time in hand, so press on. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's happened. Can you all see that? <laughs> oh, well, that's going to, uh, uh, to, to Clint uh, Brad, uh, Bradford. Um, what I would quite like um, uh, if these prize winners could email me their post addresses. Um, and it might be that if there's difficulty in sort of exporting some of these prizes because of customs and stuff like that, we might sort of do vouchers or something like that, but uh, we'll, we'll debate the fact with them. Um, so congratulations to Clint. I'm afraid you get removed. Um, and the next one is for a FunQ polo shirt. I think these come in small, medium, and large.
Well, uh, congratulations, Chris. And uh, if you let me know, email me or I'll email you and we'll get in contact and you um, can choose which size of uh, T-shirt or polo shirt you prefer. And I'm afraid you get removed. <laughs> um, the, uh, you might be interested in the delay between the name coming up and um, me resuming speaking because I'm scribbling down the, uh, the winners because I don't want to lose track because it doesn't actually record them anywhere apart from a scrap of paper I've got. And on the recording, of course, so I can always go back. So we'll just get rid of that. So I think I've got two more spins to go, uh, which are quite a good prize. One is a nano v VNA and the other is a tiny spectrum analyzer. So I'll stop that and I'll pass it back to you, Graham. Over. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, I'm seeing one further question or actually two further questions for, uh, uh, for Mike, if we could just take those. Uh, Mike, are you still about? Perhaps not. Uh, we'll answer those questions online then. Uh, so uh, next up is or should be Matt Cosby from Goon Hilly. Um, Matt is Chief Technical Technology Officer at Goon Hilly, where he works to expand the capabilities that are available on the site. These include deep space communications, orbit tracking, and the development of new communication systems. He was previously Chief Communications Engineer for Kinetics UK Space Group, and here he was responsible for technical leadership of the planetary communications team, including the UHF transceiver on ESA, ESA's ExoMars project. So uh, when we're talking to him, he knows what we're talking about, which is sometimes quite scary. Anyway, Matt is the UK Space Agency representative for the Space Link Services area of the catchily titled Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, which we all know and love as CCSDS, and the UK Delegate on the Interagency Operations Advisory Group. He's been a great supporter of BATC and AMSAT UK operations at the Goon Hilly Earth Station site uh, for over many years. And we're very grateful to him and to the whole GES team for enable us, enabling us to have such wonderful facilities at such a prestigious location. So Matt, please take our thanks back to you, uh, back to your team. And now over to you. Thank you very much. Graham, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, can you hear me okay? Great, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a presentation on how Goon Healy is going to um, support ESA missions going forward and ESA legacy missions, but also deep space missions and also how we're preparing ourselves for the inevitable cislunar economy that's going to be coming around in sort of the next five, 10 years. So if I, uh, if I just share the screen, I will share the presentation. Hopefully you can see that okay, or have I just shared the, oh, I'll just need to. Sh we can see it, but it should be in present, that's it. Is that better? Yeah, okay, great. So, um, Perfect. Thanks. so first of all, what I'll do is I'll just introduce you to Goon Hilly because most may, people don't really know where we are. So we're, we're located right on the tip, southernmost tip of the UK's mainland on the Lizard Peninsula. So we have a very good visual uh, horizon, very, very good horizon. And that's one of the reasons why it was actually put there in the first place in, back in the, in the 60s. It was uh, originally owned and operated by British Telecom. And then a small company decided to set up uh, the Goon Hilly Earth Station to save the site from, from, demolish, uh, from being demolished by British Telecom. And we thought about trying to convert it into uh, a business park and a science park. So we've been looking at using the, uh, the assets for their traditional use, so their telecoms use, um, but also looking at the larger apertures, which have sort of become a bit more redundant when now that the larger and spacecraft have become uh, more uh, better and they don't need such a large, uh, large spacecraft, a large um, the satellites on the ground. And so there, uh, we're looking at other ways around uh, for using them, including radio science um, and also deep space, which is, of course, the, the subject of what I'll be talking about. Just a bit of history of Goon Hilly. So Goon Hilly was there, set up uh, in 1962. 
to support the Telstar. Uh, first transatlantic images from, um, from America. It was also used during uh, 1985 for the Live Aid of transmitting that across uh, the world and uh, Europe, and as also used for Apollo 11, distributing the, the images from, the, from uh, early bird uh, to Europe, back to London, so it was distributed to, to, to Europe uh, and then the world. And actually, as we're having this uh, online conference, it was thought I'd put in, throw in the, that Goonhilly was also part of the first interneting experiment, which back in 1977, so used as the first internet node, um, of which of course we then use the internet, uh, as we all know. And as Graham has mentioned, uh, we're a very, a very good supporter of AMSAT and Amateur Radio. We've uh, have a, had a fun cube ground station for many years, probably a bit seven, eight years now. Uh, we were part of the Aris Ham, Ham, Ham TV station, supporting Tim Peake's Principia mission, uh, and also the following astronauts as well from, from ESA. Uh, we're also, uh, as Mike has just shown us, and thank you, Mike, for a shout out there, we were also a monitoring station for the, uh, the transponder on sale too. And um, we've done many uh, Earth, Moon, Earth, uh, activities, uh, both maybe for, for TV, but also for, for contests as well. Uh, and recently, as, as Mike has already said, we've got a web uh, SDR to support uh, the SAIL uh, transponder. Uh, we are continuing uh, to, to use, uh, to support the AMSAT um, and ARIS contacts for HAM TV. Here's the, the support for the Thomas Piscates um, uh, proximity mission. Uh, and we were the main station for the Marseille contact that, here. Okay, so that was a sort of brief overview of where we are with, uh, with Goon Hilly. Uh, so I'm going to go straight into how we are going to be hopefully supporting the sort of deep space missions going, going forward. So just give you a brief overview of the deep space uh, arena within the sort of in, in ESA and NASA. Uh, Daniel this morning gave a fantastic presentation about sort of diameters. Uh, this is the, the stations distributed around the world. There are three stations. Uh, for ESA um, there's, uh, and NASA, they're distributed. One in, in uh, NASA and ESA are both in Madrid. We have in America, we have the Goldstone for NASA and uh, Malague in Argentina for ESA. And Australia is Perth or New Norcia for ESA and uh, Canberra for NASA. Uh, luckily, um, or conveniently, the Goon uh, long, longitude is exactly the same as Madrid. So it does give you an easier handover when we are supporting uh, ESA deep space missions or even NASA deep space missions. So all the planning and so on can, can stay the same for the, the Madrid stations. And the, the likelihood is that once Madrid becomes a bit more uh, heavily loaded, then, then Goonhilly can take over. And how are we going to do that? So, so we, as I said, mentioned before, we have several large antennas and the largest antenna is actually our uh, 32 meter antenna that was last used for an Earth Moon Earth experiment, experiment for our Apollo 50 an anniversary celebrations last year. And it was originally built in 19, uh, eight, well, 1980s and sort of commissioned in 1984, but it was a, a C and KU band geostationary comms antenna. And about five years ago, we looked at how we could modify this antenna for support for the exploration mission as it was called then, which is now called Artemis One, uh, for the first flight of the SLS. Now we looked. Now the UK hadn't been investing in the human spaceflight for ESA for, for for a number of years, and actually started to do so um, in about 2012, uh, which is why Tim Peake got his flight on the space station. And we were looking at how British industry or UK industry could support the human spaceflight because we were so far behind the curve with our European colleagues. And one of the things is to look at the supporting on the ground infrastructure. So we proposed that we could support the Orion spacecraft and uh, we, we, we created um, a feasibility study working with a few companies uh, and we presented that to back to the UK Space Agency. Um, it, it then became obvious that um, that the local enterprise partnership, and you'll notice the logos in the, in the bottom corner, Cornwall and Isle uh, of uh, local enterprise partnership, saw this as a, as a great way of attracting high tech uh, jobs into the area and maintaining high tech jobs in the area. 
One of the things that people may not know is that Cornwall is a fabulously beautiful, but it is, relies a lot on tourism and agriculture. And the idea is the local government is pushing to try and uh, for, for high tech jobs. And this was a great project to be able to do that. And so actually they decided to, to fund it uh, and look at ways of, of actually getting this antenna onto the um, ESA network to be able to, to support deep space, but also to, to support the local economy. And so I, I recognise that the, 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 the Cornwall and Isles Tilly LEP and uh, UK government have obviously supported uh, working on this. Uh, we, we then work when working with ESOC as well to, to ensure that this antenna could fit seamlessly into the um, into to their network. And so what what one of the one of the uh, the study did show that we were um, that we actually built the antenna that looks like a deep space network uh, antenna. So going into the uh, the upgrade itself, the the first thing that we actually did was we did a very a very good survey of um, uh, the antenna to make sure that it was structurally sound. And that's one of the things that we had we, part of the requirements for the locals funded was that we if we showed that it was suitable that that it wasn't just going to fall down once we completed the antenna upgrade. Uh, so there was a lot of work done on the the antenna and. A survey was shown that actually structurally it is very good, but as you can see from these images, uh, it's needed a bit of sort of TLC. So there's a lot of rust because we're based very it's on a peninsula that sits sits out into to the Atlantic. Effectively, it's not probably the best place to put large metallic structures. So they've had a bit of corrosion over the years, uh, but nothing. Only sort of a superficial. So these things can be uh, be. Be, be maintained, be, be changed, be refurbished. So just looking at the back structure, this uh, on this antenna here on the left hand side, you can see that the um, this is where the feed is actually housed. So this is you can see a bit of rust and you can see on the right hand side, the the actual imp, the, the, the reflector is quite dirty and needs a bit of a, a, a lick of paint uh, and cleaning up. Now, once we embarked on this uh, upgrade, it was clear, and uh, Phil mentioned about the documentation for FunCube, this, this antenna did not have a um, sort of as-built log. Uh, it, the documentation going back to 1984 was not, not poor, was very poor, because no one envisaged this being converted into some uh, changing the feed, changing the pointing accuracy and so on. So we had to start from scratch and, and there were no CAD models. So we had to sort of develop these CAD models. And the way we did it is that actually there was a local company, very, very local, only 10 minutes down the road where they use LIDAR techniques. So laser scanning techniques, and they actually use it for the marine, uh, in, for their marine um, industry where they, they have boats uh, that need to be retrofitted. And they just put a laser scanner down into the, into the inside of a, of a ship uh, and they do scanning. Uh, and then they get the inside and then they can work, design something new so they know it can fit. And so they wanted to sort of say, well, if we can do it with a boat, why can't we do it with an antenna? So we gave them some trials and they came up with a, with a very, very good uh, CAD model based around these LiDAR um, scans. And then that created the, the CAD model that we could then feed in to, to the upgrade. Now, one, one of the, obviously I've mentioned that it was originally a KU band, so sort of uh, 12 to 16, uh, and we needed to be X band, so eight, and we needed to be S band, so two, two, uh, um, uh, two gigs. And one of the things that was a, a, a risk on the risk register is that actually the, the way beam waveguide, or the, the hole in the middle of the antenna here, where the, the power of the energy goes, goes down into the feed cabinet here, uh, whether that hole was actually big enough to be able to support S-band and we've since this shown through analysis that, that is the case but only because we've had the the accurate drawings um, from this laser scanning. One of the things we've also noticed is that we to support deep space we need to be able to to rotate um, uh, obviously zero to 360 that supports anything on on the uh, on the ecliptic so Mars and the moon and so on but we also wanted to support highly elliptical orbit spacecraft and, and prime example is integral which sits in a very highly elliptical uh, orbit with the apogee over the northern hemisphere and for that we we get visibility of that spacecraft for three days constantly but it does mean it has to go 
uh, the antenna sort of winds itself up and you need to be able to support about a, quite a large sort of run in azimuth if you want to be able to support the full three days. So then we decided that actually we looked at trying to move the current um, to move the current travel range from zero to 360 to zero to 540, which involves designing this, the cable wrap to be able to, so it doesn't wind itself up completely um, uh, and then unwind itself. And so that was then done. That's been uh, designed and built and actually now installed. And then I'll show you later uh, this actually working. The, one of the other things was that the pointing accuracy, the pointing performance, the antenna was originally designed only for to support geostationary communications, which is means that the antenna moves very slowly and tracks around a figure of eight. Obviously, we want to be able to track deep space, and we want to track integral, but we also want to be able to move the antenna quickly from mission to mission. So we looked at trying to improve the pointing and tracking speed from about 0.2 of a degree, or 0.1 and uh, 1 and 5, 1.4 degrees per second to near 0.4 degrees a second to be able to cope with um, and moving quickly between missions and actually unwinding it. If we are supporting integral, then we want to move to support um, support maybe Mars missions. Now. This involved obviously replacing the motors. We had originally just thought that the, the motors here, this is a full, the full motor and the gearbox, we were trying to keep the gearboxes the same, but actually in a risk sort of risk analysis, it was decided that it made more sense to replace everything back into the interface and design the, the, the gearboxes the, the, uh, from scratch. So the, that's exactly what we did. Uh, we took these motors and gearboxes off, uh, posted them, well, uh, Couriered them to um, to Germany and and to to do an analysis of the the gearboxes and then the motors to ensure that the, the motors and gearboxes could could be fitted back onto the structure and also there's a risk reduction as well having the gearboxes and the motors in the in the factory where all the rest of the servo is being created then then it lowers the risk of the interfaces going forward. We also looked at having a one second one degree a second uh, move so we could move even faster and actually um, track Leo. The, however, there was a, the, the risk was too high on the, on the mechanical stress because it was never designed for that and it was too much of a risk. So therefore we decided that we weren't going to do that. So this is just to give you, this is, this is a sort of a picture just to give you a, an overview of the, of the, the, the size of the, uh, the, the gearboxes. So we have a standard German engineer standing there. So you can give you an idea of the, the scale of these, and of these gearboxes uh, just here. So I also mentioned that we were changing the frequency. So we then had to we had to design uh, the optics to be able to support the different feed. So the feed itself was about six meters tall. Uh, this was a dual KU band C band uh, uh, feed uh, that needed to be removed and uh, redesigned to be able to cope uh, with the, the new feed, which is slightly uh, bigger uh, to support the S band and X band. So the idea was actually for the, the there were about five options uh, presented by the the designer, and we adopted actually that the minimum uh, change on the antenna was to to remove here the M4 mirror, the, the last mirror before it goes to the feed. So we had to redesign that particular uh, mirror to be able to to support the new feed. Oops, I'm going. Okay, and so we we then designed uh, had to design the new mirror uh, the new mirror. So that was designed. This is in the factory. You can see large dots on here. These are the calibration dots to demonstrate that the mirror is being formed correctly. Uh, and then actually we, we lowered the, 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 the new mirror into the, the system um, just before the summer. So just to give you a, a sort of design of the, of the feed, this is a, the, a feed based on an original, uh, original design. Uh, and this is the feed going in, being lit, craned into, into the site and has now been um, has now been installed uh, ready for use again we've now got a, a, U, a standard UK engineer standard give, a giving and a German engineer just show, showing you the scale of this of this feed as it was going in you also notice that the the rusting on the on the feed housing or the Wendy house as we called it this is that unit has been completely replaced uh, and actually been designed and installed by a local company that's, uh, that's uh, insulated it and has, has conditioned it uh, and it's all ready to go. 
I also mentioned um, that we were trying to keep everything the same as an ESA DSA station, so it fits in very well with the S track system. Uh, the one deviation is the is the monitoring and control. So we've decided to take out one of the ESA computers, um, and we we're going to a design. We are designing our own monitoring and control based on a commercial system that's used uh, quite a large uh, a lot of times within commercial satcom stations uh, and hope um, but we were also from a risk again a risk mitigation perspective we're using the same front-end controller that ESA uses uh, to be able just again is to is to, to limit that risk I, I mentioned risk I've mentioned it a few times we're trying to get this uh, up and running very quickly but we also want to make it familiar to ESA so they then can can use it because it, there's no guarantees that they can they will use it but uh, we know we, by working with them we are, are building up that relationship with them and the idea is that as part of the the ESA network we'll, we'll form part of the ESA augmented network now to support these missions support the legacy missions the Mars Express is the integrals but also the lunar missions going going forward uh, and also the, maybe the lunar uh, payload that was discussed earlier, but also the commercial missions, we've got to have a back-end sort of modem processor that's based, that can support all these CCSDS mo module, um, mo modulations and coding. And we've decided that we base it around the, the current system that they have on um, in the ESA network. And so this is what's known as a, the TTCP, so it's a very good ranging system, but also a modem, uh, but it's based around an SDR. So again, what Daniel's fabulous talk this morning, again, using SDRs, this is a, a bit more expensive SDR, but it is based in um, what's used in, in the ESA station. We are using, uh, we are designing our own spacecraft simulator to, to help us understand how these things all fit together and help, help understand how ESA operate it, and it helps us with, with the operations. The simulator is installed in the station, and the idea is that we configure the, the simulator to the mission that we're going to support that shows the station is ready to go, um, is ready to go for when this, the, the satellite comes over the horizon. In addition to, to this, the protocols that are being used, there are going to be protocols that are, um, that are up and running. So we, we're trying to be moving to a more of a network centric architecture. So delay tolerant networking is going to be used. We want to be the first station to be able to offer that. But also AOS, which is being used on the Orion capsule, which is going to take the next human back to the moon. And also DVBS, which Mike showed earlier when he was talking over uh, a sale two. Those are likely to be adopted by the commercial companies, so the Eclipse providers, um, the, uh, the, the human landing systems that are, are through the Artemis program. So where are we then? I showed you the picture before, which was not a nice sort of uh, showed you there was a good, uh, it was a good structure, but needed a good lick of paint. We, we've given that lick of paint over the summer and the backing structure has been been upgraded and, and painted and we've had we've replaced about 80 percent of all the bolts which took seven months uh, 100 bolts a day so you can work out how many bolts we had to change we've painted it all back again and um, it's now looking very good and as you can see very very shiny very very clean ready for action uh, I know Mike is a bit more ambitious with his live demonstration I'm going to try video so let's see if this works. Hopefully it is working. Um, I can't see anyone, so I'm just assuming it is going to work. But as you can see, this is a test. Hopefully it is working. It's fine. As, oh, brilliant. And so it is going, hopefully you'll see it going round and round and round, hopefully zero to 540. So you can see it's fully uh, from, it's, it's increased from its zero to, to 360. Clearly this is a time lapse. You can see that from the, the people running around on top of the, of the antenna. But again, it's, it's, it's designed to go up to 92 degrees and you just see it knocked back to, um, to, to, to Zenith. So we've, we have the feed installed, we have the servos working, we have the, uh, everything is ready to go. So it's ready to go um, to actually start supporting missions and we hopefully we should be ready, we should be looking at talking to Mars Express by the next this next month, uh, starting qualification testing with with ESA by uh, by December, 
uh, and hopefully we are going to be ready to support Artemis 1. So Artemis 1 has Orion and it's going to be uncrewed, and, but it'll also be taking 13 CubeSats. So we'd like to be able to support uh, one, a few, few of those CubeSats as they are dropped off on the way to the, uh, to the moon. Now, I, I meant just quickly mention the, the sort of missions that we're planning on supporting. Now, Integral is on, it's just here on the left-hand side, uh, a, a legacy mission that's been operating for, for many years, sort of 15, 16 years, uh, highly elliptical. So hopefully we'll be wanting to support that as an S-band link. The X, a Mars Express, as Graham mentioned, I've worked on, on Mars Express. So uh, we're looking forward to receiving Mars Express around Mars uh, in, the, in the near future, hopefully next month. And Gaia, Gaia sits at L2, which is the Lagrange point of the Earth and Sun. So it sits um, at the far side of the Earth. Um, so it's a nighttime, it was face, it has the Earth between the Sun. So it's, it's always at night in these operations, but it does have a large, and a large number of uh, high data throughput. So it does take up the DSN, DSA time. So again, it'd be great for us to be able to support those missions. Currently, we have a license to support Integral, and we're currently in the middle of obtaining a license for Mars Express. So we have a license to transmit at the moment to Integral. So that's, uh, that's great. But also I mentioned there's the, the, the cis lunar environment um, uh, that's going to be uh, taken off. The, the human landing, we've got sort of the 2024 ambitions of trying to get to, to the moon with humans on the, on the surface of the moon. But also the commercial providers, and hopefully, can't say too much about it at the moment, but hopefully we'll be supporting a lunar lander, hopefully this time next year. The first sort of commercial lunar lander, that'd be uh, fabulous. And just to give you a demo, just to give you a sort of an overview of what we expect to support from Artemis 1, is that the Orion going towards the moon is get, get dropped off, uh, CubeSats get dropped off along the way, and they do either go in, try and get themselves into orbit or do flybys, and again, They'll take up a lot of time for the DSM, and we'd like to operate uh, or support any of those those missions as they as they're compatible with the DSM. As uh, we are compatible with DSM because we follow the the, uh, the protocols set down by CCSDS. As we will be an augmented ESA station, we will be very much compatible with, with NASA as well. So, uh, as a sort of a run through, sort of an eighteen month program. Uh, so, in summary, then we. Whoops, we should be um, we should be ready as an ESA augmented network come sort of um, sort of March next year. The project has been funded through the local enterprise partnership to try and support jobs, and we've increased the the our company. We started off in two thousand and eleven with three people, we're now up to fifty people, uh, and we are, are, are going to start employing more and more people as for the operations as well. Along with the ESA supported protocols, we'll support the, the, the additional ones that we're expecting that the, the new lunar landers to support the DVBS2 and, and with, we, we expect that the human landing system will be, will be requiring sort of 4K or even 8K from the, the lunar surface of, of when the next humans go, go on or the first and the first woman lands on the moon sort of 2024 timescale. Uh, and we know that those are going to we need those stations to, to support those. So, as I said, we're going to be operational 2021, March 2021, and to support sort of robotic and the hum, human space flight and, and actually humans returning back to the moon. And that's me. So I'll open it to questions. Very good, Matt. Thank you very much indeed. Really good. And um, I must say, when we took the first fun cube, uh, monitoring station to Goon Hilly. We were privileged to go and have a look around uh, uh, and it's really nice. I mean, a lot of it is the old BT going back to the 60s stuff. And there's one corridor, which has some, I think it's a corridor electric theater. It has a lot of wood paneling in it. It looked really fantastic. But uh, I guess now it's looking a lot more smart. It is, yes, it is. Modern. It is looking um, a bit more modern. I've got one question of my own for you, which is not not really following your, your talk. I just wondered, I know, Current conditions are difficult. Is the visitor center still on the plan? The visitor center, we have. Uh, so yeah, we do have a visitor center. It is closed. Um, we we have an in, an investor that uh, has made it clear that we need to make the, the the station profitable and sustainable, and that's what we need to be doing first. We are we we do want to to have a visitor center open. We are passionate about STEM, 
the reason why we're having these conversations now and the reason why we've hosted so many AMSAT and uh, uh, amateur radio stations are on Goon Hilly is because we wanted to promote the sort of high tech job. So actually promoting that through a visitor, state, a visitor center is actually some of an ambition, but um, we can't, we need to focus at the moment and we need to get this up and running. And once we've got it up and running and it's all uh, working, then, then we'll open it. Yeah, I must say the, the uh, um, ham TV from the ISS when Tim Pete was on board was a huge success as far as the sort of uh, Aris project was concerned. We're extremely grateful for uh, no, it's great fun. Yeah. As you probably know, sadly, I think Ham TV has had to come back to Earth for repair, or the equipment rather. Uh, but hopefully, um, it's it's nearly there. Now, look, well, hopefully, we'll, and we'll still support it going going once it's back. Excellent. Up, That's right. good news. Uh, now, look, we've got quite a few uh, about five questions, and one is from Nitin Kumar in in uh, India. Um, hi, Matt. Is the DSN antenna in Bangalore, India, used as part of the Deep Space Global Network? Do you know? It, it is. It is used. Um, uh, not. Not well, because of large antennas, there there are few and far between. So they are used. Um, people use uh, antennas all the time. So this is known as cross support. So India is part of the. So Israel is part of the IOEG and CCSDS. So they support um, support missions, and so does the DSN supports their missions. So they're their missions around the, uh, the uh, Mars at the moment, but also the, the lunar missions that, that Israel are working on. And I think ESA support them as well as NASA. And, and so, yes, they do. Everything's sort of cross-supported. Excellent. Uh, next question from Noel Matthews of TV fame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he knows the answer to this, I think, Noel. No, no. And, uh, uh, it's, he, he says, Matt, do, do you need, did you need to replace or modify the Cassegrain reflector to accommodate the change in frequency? So we, what we did is we measured the, um, the profile of the antenna. Well, I say we, uh, somebody unfortunately had to hang 40 meters up from a, a cherry picker when the antenna was pointing at Zenith to take for images when they had stickers on it to, dem to show the profile. We, we showed that actually you it could be uh, modified. There are these panels are actually bolted onto the, to the the platform, and you can actually adjust them. But it was decided that it was too much of a risk to adjust them because we would only improve it by about half a dB or 0.6 of a dB. And to be honest, that was not worth the risk. That if we damaged it and put, took it further back, then we could just live with half a dB loss. So no, we haven't modified it. No. Okay. Uh Next question, uh, what is your expected RF gain from this nice new dish? And that's yeah. from Brian Hard. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to do this off the top of my head now, aren't I? <laughs> I, mean, I, just, I think you probably know, I think maybe if I, if I get this wrong, I will answer it offline. But I think it's about six, uh, at X band, I think it's about 65 dBs. Okay, we won't, we won't quote you on that. <laughs> okay, well, I will check and then I, can, okay. I will answer if I'm wrong. Very good. Um, next question from uh, David Ryan. Will you try to listen for any space DX like Voyager one and two? Absolutely. I'm not, I, I've always said that as soon as I receive Voyager, I'm retiring. So I we will, <laughs> we, we, will, we will find a way of receiving Voyager if it's the last thing I do, because I think we want to try. I know Voyager is um, such a long, obviously a long way away and it requires large, large antennas. So uh, we, there are, we have another antenna on, on the station, which is, um, which actually, because it's a receive only is actually going to be a better um g over t because it's a cooled and a cooled feed so we can we're looking at arraying the two up as well although we only get a sort of a sort of a 3 db or less than that actually but um th there are opportunities to try and get voyager and i'd love to get voyager yeah i know that they've done so at bockham in germany so oh okay well that's, you're yeah. up for it now. <laughs> Yeah, that, no, no, I've always wanted to. I've always wanted to. <laughs> okay, next question. I hope I get this right. Uh, what T sys in receive and P out in transmit do you have there? And that's a question from Mario Lorenz. Okay, so the, 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 the system temperature is not, we're not cooling the, temp, the LNA, so they're not going to be that, that uh, great. I don't know the, um, the exact figure, but the, it's probably of the order of about 85 Kelvin. Um, the, the power transmit, we are the in, in both S and X, we have two and a half kilowatts. So that, that within the DSM world, that's considered low power. 
but it's uh, we have the option of, of improving and increasing those because we can modulize them. But at the moment, the the uh, the plan is to have two and a half kilowatts for X and S band. Okay. They're all dual redundant as well, so we do have multiple. So we we can put them all together. The feed are, is only so sort of rated to eight kilowatts. Okay. Uh, next question, uh, not, uh, it says, uh, oh yes, what is the upper limit now it has been upgraded? And that question from Mike Willis, G0NJW. Upper limit for what, sorry, Mike? Uh, he just says, what's the upper limit now it has been upgraded? I guess that's... Frequency, is it? Frequency band. Oh, frequency band. So that's uh, eight, eight and a half, 8.4 okay. gigs. And I think there was... Think, but that's well, that, limited that, to the feed, so that's the, the the profile of the dish. Obviously, because it was it was for higher frequency, could cope with a higher frequency. But uh, we're limited by the feed now. Okay, uh, Matt, I think we'll let you off the hook on that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, uh, Jim, can I just jump in and just say yeah. to to Matt that don't be intimidated by the fact that Bockham uh, received Voyager. That was some well, whichever one it was. That was some years ago, so it was nearer then. So, you know, that's fine. No, no, I, 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 I think I, I was just, I haven't, I haven't got my uh, Voyager thing here, but I, I, I do, Voyager is, um, is a thing, a, a wonderful spacecraft okay. which I want to receive. Yeah, can so I, can it's I, too long or it'll, get, it'll go too far away. Yes, I know, yeah. <laughs> can I also mention that at one point GHY6 was used for a really important test which had two or three radio amateurs sitting in the uh, in the actual feed point uh, with a I'm not sure whether it was a Lime or a Pluto SDR fed with some crummy webcam and that worked without any amplification for uh, Oscar 100 so it's a very good reflector you've got there thank you Matt you're welcome I remember it well Matt, thanks very much indeed for your efforts, and particularly giving up your Sunday afternoon. Um, I've, no, I've been watching. I've been I've been on YouTube all morning. Oh, I've good, <laughs> excellent. Thank you. Well, um, you're very welcome, and thank you very much indeed for your uh, for your co contribution. No problem. It's been a uh, pleasure. You'll get a virtual round of applause just now. Thank you. <laughs> Bye for now. So now look, we'll go to uh, the dreaded wheel of fortune and see if that's. We're fortunate enough, fortunate enough to get it in a working mode. I'm just going to leave it there for a bit because um, I think it's probably just taking a while to sort of uh, to get going. Uh, what I would say is uh, we are interested in your comments on the um, uh, on the on the how it's gone, whether we can improve it. Uh, obviously, next year we're not certain whether it's going to be live or um, uh, another of these virtual ones, but. Uh, we will be interested in any feedback and you can email either Graham and I and uh, towards the end uh, I'm going to put up a, a slide which has got our email addresses on. Uh, so I think this thing has warmed up. I'm getting an arrow in the middle which is normally a good thing. So uh, this is the next prize which is the Nano VNA. <laughs> Well done, Adrian, and congratulations. I'll be in contact with you, assuming we've got your uh, email address or you can email me. And I'm afraid you don't get two prizes, so you get removed. <laughs> so uh, how are we doing time-wise? It's now 15, 28 by my clock. Uh, oh, well. Let's have a one minute yeah, no, break, Jim. Just about on time. Okay, Graham, over to you and do decide what you want to do, whether have a break or keep going. Okay, uh, I think we've got time for just a one minute break, a natural break before the next presentation, which comes up at 15.30. Very good.
Good. Uh, hope everybody enjoyed that short but important break. Um, okay, we're now uh, now the time has moved on and uh, the sun has moved across the sky. Uh, we're now moving over to the to the US for our next uh, two presentations. Actually, um, one is from uh, Jerry Buxton and the other one is from Drew, uh, which will include a demonstration. We hope. So the uh, uh, Jerry N zero J Y, uh, as you probably know, he's vice president of engineering of uh, AMSAT in the US. Uh, unfortunately, he has to be on an aircraft at this particular moment. Uh, so he's kindly pre-recorded his talk on the lessons learned in the Fox program. So as they used to say, roll VT. Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to share a topic by request that I have not discussed in any of my presentations before. I did touch on it as part of my larger symposium 2017 engineering presentation, but now I have more time and more detail on the subject. I had hoped to be doing this as a live streamed event, but as it turns out, that's not possible today. I am right now at DFW airport in the flesh, waiting to board my flight to Los Angeles, just as this presentation ends. I'm off to an undisclosed location with an unnamed satellite, and that's really all I can say. But I, I guess I could add that the satellite will not come back with me. I believe that you will have an opportunity to ask questions at the end that will be relayed to me to be answered. The request was that I make a presentation on lessons learned from our FOX-1 series satellite projects. My presentation only includes FOX-1 A through D because of time and because of their common avionics. FOX-1 E is a departure from more than just the FM repeater. I will cover most but not all learning opportunities as there were many. And I want to include as much of the setup and reasons behind each lesson as I can. So the lesson has depth rather than just something like we learned not to do this. I'll start with Fox 1A, of course. AO85 was the first built and first launched Fox satellite. And then I will proceed in the order of the build. You could say that Fox 1A was a lesson all about antennas. January 12th of 2015, I got an email from Bob Davis, our mechanical engineer, and said uh, the antennas just pulled right out of a cocoon of solder. The antennas had come detached from the solar panels on the flight model of the satellite. Of course, this was just within two months of delivering integration. So there uh, was a time crunch automatically. We discussed several solutions and the least unacceptable one, given the time available, was to use a conductive epoxy to reinforce the antennas after re-soldering them. This is something that uh, our antenna team had experience with. And so it wasn't something that was just a wild idea. In doing so though, the application of the epoxy covered a bit more of the PCB than planned and uh, that left us with insufficient time to redo the epoxy in a uh, cleaner manner or to test the effectiveness and effect of the repair. We also found as we went into environmental testing and came out of the vibe tests, we saw an issue where the tip of the stowed receive antenna relaxed slightly during the vibration testing. It was written up in the environmental test report and we also presented it to NASA and our uh, launch integrator because it caused a violation of the envelope. The envelope is described in the CubeSat design specification. So we exceeded that by a little less than a millimeter. Ultimately though, everything was fine, if you will, no waiver or changes were needed as we were on the bottom of the P-pod, the first one in, therefore the antenna was against the pusher plate and would not cause any complications. So what we learned from that, Lou McFadden, he designed and implemented an entirely different method of soldering and securing the antennas to the solar panels, and that has uh, worked out to be far superior than what we originally had. 
we discovered that even something as simple, seemingly simple as the antenna stow line that keeps it uh, tied down can be a factor in a failure. So that's something we take into account with any give in the burn resistor and such, as happened with Fox 1A. We also learned when we got to orbit that uh, the monopole wire antennas being not in line with the axis may not be the greatest idea in the sense of the shadowing caused by the satellite body. The receive antenna is only about six inches. So uh, depending on your look angle, it could be behind the satellite during part of the spin. And uh, there's distortion by the antenna as it whips around. If you imagine a long, in the case of the two meter antenna, it's a couple of feet. And as the satellite is spinning around and it's off axis, it kind of tends to want to wobble and spiral in a cone at the tip. The top left and right images show the tip of the receive antenna before and after the vibe test. You'll notice the difference in how it has slipped and extended a little further out. The bottom left image shows the burn resistor with the stow line, as well as the epoxy application on the receive antenna root. Note the epoxy on the tip end of the antenna as well in the top left image. These were enough to detune the antenna and overall reduce sensitivity. Remember, this is a conductive epoxy. Next up, the second bill was Fox 1C or Fox 1 Cliff AO95, and uh, that turned out also to be the fourth one launched. Lesson Fox 1 Cliff stepped it up as if Fox 1A was a cakewalk. It is notable for the very puzzling anomaly of the inability to charge the battery. In testing of the flight unit, I found that the battery was not charging at all in the full sun. The telemetry and other functions were nominal, and in fact, it would sit side by side with Fox 1D testing when they were in the sun, and there was no evident uh, difference or cause of what was going on with Fox 1 Cliff. The schedule for these two required an environmental testing date that occurred while we were still troubleshooting the battery charge problem. So I took it to Orlando along with Fox 1D as both were to be tested and would fly together. While Fox 1D began its environmental tests, we worked on Fox 1 Cliff in my hotel room. It was an excellent challenge, but at the worst time and in probably the worst place for troubleshooting a satellite. While Fox 1D was being tested, we determined that the cause of the problem was the MPPT. It stopped working when the IHU booted. That meant no power at all coming from the solar panels, and there was no obvious relationship between the two systems that we could put together to figure out what was going on. But we did eventually chase that down to find that the problem was caused by a short between the MPPT solar safe line and the IHU warning LED control line. The likely cause would be a solder bridge on one of the bus connectors in the stack. All the boards and systems pass all the bus lines through that connector so that each one of the boards on the stack has access to all of them. So it could have been anywhere. And we were actually just looking at the assembled box and trying to determine that. The MPPT solar safe line is grounded by the remove before flight pin to prevent any accidental activation by sunlight. So the MPPT couldn't function when the line is low. The IHU warning LED line goes low after it has been alternating high and low, flashing the uh, LED. And that resulted then that the MPPT could charge the battery for about an hour after being deployed from the launch vehicle. And then when the uh, timer ran out, the IHU would wake up and shut the MPPT off. We came up with two viable options to resolve the situation. The first would be to ask Spaceflight, which was our launch integrator, for an extension of our delivery date so that we could disassemble Fox 1 Clef and locate the short, and then hopefully replace or repair the boards. The second would be to apply a software change to modify the signals that the IHE was putting on the warning lead control line. With the first option, we didn't have a guarantee that we would be able to fix the problem. 
and uh, we didn't know how much time would likely be granted. The second option has no guarantee that the MPPT would work if and when the IHU failed for good. So after a late night flip chart session, we concluded that the software change was the least unacceptable solution. The result of the change would just hold the IHU warning lead high after the post uh, launch vehicle deploy. For lessons learned, the bus connectors have a very small footprint that requires proper and careful soldering and uh, post soldering inspection. So we added testing of the pass through pins as a requirement for all the system board assemblies. That was not something that was specified in any ICD, so the builders of that system may or may not have thought to perform that work. We also found that this presented a lesson in the importance and capability of teamwork. Teamwork by dedicated volunteers cannot be overstated. Rapid risk assessment with all tools available can be done even under the pressure of schedule. So the three of us were able to come to a solution even though we were in a hotel room. Next up then, Fox 1D Delta AO92, which was the third one built right after or actually partly concurrently with Fox 1 Cliff and the third one launched. Lesson Fox 1D can be summed up as too shaky. The cancellation of the Sherpa mission on which Fox 1 Cliff and Fox 1D would fly resulted in a change of launch vehicles for both. In the case of Fox 1D, further environmental testing was required for the PSLV launch qualification. After that testing, it was found that the Plus Z solar panel had an intermittent problem in the post environmental tests. The cause wasn't fully understood, but owing to the fact that there were uh, extra pins on the connector that weren't used, we white wired those for a redundancy. We then found uh, as the tests progressed that the receive was not working. It was determined to be in the receiver and there was a component with a bad solder joint. This required then, again, disassembly. The receiver was set off to be repaired and tested and then back to Bob again for reassembly. We were then required to perform further acceptance level environmental testing because we had breached the structure. Having high confidence in your flight model is important before you go to environmental testing. You don't wanna to have to open it up and test it again. That just increases the chances of something failing. Proper soldering and inspection again is critical. However, that may not have changed this outcome due to the need for the second shake and bake. Environmental testing plays a part in launch planning. Changing the LV of course is not likely on our part, but AMSAT has talked about an on the shelf strategy of having satellites ready to go. You at least have to account for the time to perform those environmental tests and you want to have that confidence to do it one time only. So you won't be able to do that until you have secured a launch and understand what those requirements are. In addition, trying to test ahead with the variety of uh, launch vehicle requirements, it's pointless to try to guess which test might satisfy uh, whatever launch might come along. Fox 1B AO91 was the fourth one built and the second one launched. Fox 1B, after three previous lessons, you might expect to be a bit better, but the teacher was relentless and it was kind of like a song I've heard. Our initial attempt at the day in the life test for Fox 1B revealed a short in one of the antenna burn resistor circuits. That wound up frying the IHU deploy switch power transistor due to the high current. We replaced the IHU with the flight spare IHU, which required shipping the satellite to Bob Davis. And uh, he disassembled it, swapped out the IHUs, reassembled it and shipped it back to me. This video clip, which is from the DITL test, shows the moment of the failure. It confounded me, especially after several other DITL with the previous birds. I knew what I heard, but it did not match what I saw. High tone. Well, I heard a high tone for a second.
but then the fact, what the hell did I hear? Those of you with eagle eyes may have seen that. You think I'm hearing things? What the hell did I hear? This is a great example of smoke where you don't want it. Actually, if I had seen the smoke at the time, that might have expedited things in determining that something was wrong. Fox 1B, Chapter 2. After the IHU swap, we had to rerun the DITL test, and that revealed an internal open in the receive antenna deploy circuit. The receive antenna deploy follows the transmit antenna deploy, so we never were able to see that on the first go around. This issue was determined to be on the MPPT board. So again, shipped it to Bob, he disassembled it, swapped out the MPPT for the flight spare, reassembled it and shipped it back to me. Fox 1B chapter three, and by now we are thinking maybe we ought to buy some FedEx stock. So once we had the IHU and MPPT swapped out, we did some testing of that rework and found that there was a birdie that kept the transmitter COR activated. Why not? The cause was not related to the previous issues and it was determined to be in the receiver where there was a component with a bad solder joint. To repair the receiver, I shipped the entire satellite to Dan Habaker. He partially disassembled it and uh, removed the receiver, had to take the shield off to get to the component, repaired it, tested it, and then reassembled the shield and partially reassembled the satellite. It was shipped to Bob for final reassembly again, back to spec, and he shipped it to me. Fox 1B Chapter 4. And by now, we're certain that we should have bought some FedEx stock. So we got to run the official DITL, and in further uh, operational testing, it was discovered now that the transmit power was low. The investigation revealed that the antenna cable had come unseated from the connector during the previously mentioned rework. So this one, I was able to perform in Fox Lab by myself. I took the minus Z solar panel off and that cable is right at the bottom of the transmitter under that panel. I reseated it, reconnected it and, and secured it, put the minus Z panel on and tested the circuit. But because the satellite was breached, it was necessary to demonstrate to the APEC and NASA that the removal and replacement of the solar panel did not invalidate the DITL test. The DITL test is to ensure the integrity of the software and hardware as far as deployables that uh, they will not activate prior to the minimum amount of time that the launch provider allows after we've been deployed. And I could edit that part out if I need to. This is an image of the uh, transmit coax after being repaired. You can see where it mates with the MMCX connector, and I added a little more capped on tape just for good measure. Fox 1B lessons learned included the fact that short and open failures on commercial PCBs can occur despite the order requiring electrical testing by the manufacturer. It seems to have been a luck of the draw, though, and then that we would get two boards in the same satellite. Solder inconsistencies and assembly errors. We found that schedule pressure may affect the time that it takes for proper and careful procedures, especially when we're in a time crunch. There were some consistent occurrences across all four satellites, as you may have noticed. The cells in the original design have been discontinued prior to the design. The takeaway is for development to take into account the realistic time required for a project to reach beginning of life on orbit because of both our volunteer workforce, but also the uh, ever slipping launches. Also, the original design does not allow for proper battery maintenance. There's a charging port and it is a very basic design. 
to allow you to charge the battery without battery conditioning. The depth of discharge for these batteries also exceed the best practice. The solution to that is to balance the stored energy capacity with a realistic power budget for longest life. You simply should not exceed that, no matter the desire to include as much as you can in the satellite. Cold solder joints, solder bridges, and so forth have been seen in all of the Fox 1s. Again, looking at rush situations where the team feels compelled to hurry their work. It's important to test all the possible paths and connections, especially for these connectors. And using PCB vendor assembly services with densely populated boards. And even if time is too short to ensure proper work by our team members, we don't want to create a setup to fail situation. Then there's Murphy, an adversary that every ham knows and no ham has conquered. Satellites are like Murphy on steroids. It's unbelievable the number of things that can go wrong in one single satellite. Despite the seemingly clone design of the Fox 1, every satellite had its own experience. The failures seem to grow more common and more complex the closer you get to the completion data integration. Both of these require a mission plan that targets completion with a good margin ahead of the actual target set by the launch provider. In terms of execution, of course, you always want to avoid groupthink, but especially in stressful situations during the mission or project. And finally, don't for a minute think that these lessons learned are anything but part of a much larger lesson that you can expect many more lessons down the road. But that's part of the fun. I'd like to thank you all again for the opportunity, and uh, I hope you appreciated what has gone on and uh, what kind of lessons can be derived from all these opportunities. Also, don't forget to join us for AMSAT Space Symposium, some virtual fun on October 17th. Details on AMSAT.org, of course. I'm Wheels Up. Goodbye for now. Sorry about that. <laughs> I get the hang of this one day. Uh, I like that. I'm wheels up. <laughs> I'm wheels. I'm wheels down firmly on the ground at the minute. Um, I don't, we haven't. That no one's asked a question, uh, so um, which would be difficult for Jerry to answer as that was as that was a recording. So, um, oh, what's going on here? So I'm going to um, go straight into the. Uh, into the uh, into the next raffle, uh, Jim. Yep. Uh, Jim, while you were doing that, ah. Yep. Okay. Uh, there's a question on on the chat oh, okay. from Clint about what does MPPT stand for? Oh, maximum PowerPoint tracking. Do you, uh, which is uh, uh, oh, uh, you could probably answer that better than me, Graham. Actually. Phil, Phil says he's happy to answer that online, so we'll let him do that. Okay. But if you could type an answer, that, that would be good. Oh, I see there's another one from Brian as well. What happened with what's Cliff Receiver? Don't know if the answer to that question. Maybe someone could type an answer online. Oh. Okay. Uh, so let's leave the questions because we're we've just about caught up now, haven't we? What time is? So I'm just checking my. Uh... Yeah, ready to roll with the last. Uh... Yeah, ready to roll with the last thing. So let's let's uh, give it a go. See if we're in luck. I think we are. This is the uh, very last uh, raffle draw, and this is for a tiny spectrum analyzer. And those little mini things, which I know are. Our chairman uses, but he uses both the, the nano DNA and this uh, tiny spectrum analyzer, and uh, he's very impressed with them. So, good luck, everybody.
he goes as well. So, okay. Congratulations, Steve. Uh, and uh, we'll we'll be in contact. I see there's a couple of Q and A's there. Okay. I don't think they're ones I can uh, I can answer. Maybe uh, one of the panelists could uh, type in an answer for those. Um, and I, I almost, um, I don't know about ITAR, I used to know, but uh, I don't know because things change. So um, over to you, Graham, I think. Okay, well, we've got a bit of time until the next scheduled uh, presentation, which is Drew and his demonstration of operating uh, satellites from a portable situation. I've seen some images from him. Looks like he's doing a, a, a brilliant outside broadcast or getting set up to do a brilliant outside broadcast from uh, from Florida. Uh, it's about three minutes away from four o'clock. So we'll take a short pause uh, and start on time at 1600 BST, 1500 UTC. See you back in just under three minutes.
Good. If I'm unmuted, that should be fine. Thank you for that. Uh, and now we go actually to our to our last our last session, our last speaker, uh, Drew Glassbrenner, KO4MA, who I can see is ready to go from sunny sunny Florida. And uh, wow, <laughs> we've kind of. I, I, th I think this this colloquium will go down as to the to, obviously it's the first one that's been done online, but it will go down as the one that's had the most varied set of presentations. I can't think of one where we've had more varied presentations. Anyway, Drew's been a licensed radio amateur since the late '80s. He's active on satellites, been active on satellites since RS12 in the early 1990s. He enjoys operating portable. Uh, while traveling, having operated from multiple station, multiple locations from the Caribbean to the UK, Denmark, and across the US from Alaska to his home in Florida. Oh, but uh, yeah, he also does some stuff for AMSAT too, he says. Drew, are you ready to go? I'm ready. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Thank you. Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Sorry about the, uh, the hat, but it's uh, in the upper 80s and... Uh, hot here today. Um, I'm uh, coming to you from the hood of my pickup truck in the front yard. Uh, instead of a uh, PowerPoint presentation, this is uh, going to be like we've done in the past uh, in the parking lot of the hotel. So uh, it'll be off the cuff. Um, <laughs> just want to do a little demonstration for you this morning. Uh, we're going to make a contact hopefully on XW2A in a little bit. Um, the pass comes up uh, in about 17 minutes, so I've got a little bit of stalling to do. Uh, when <clears throat> a lot of people are uh, uh, getting into portable operating lately, um, I can tell you it wasn't as popular uh, back when I got started with things. Uh, you didn't see as many rovers, you didn't see as many people uh, uh, with HTs and arrows, you didn't see people with 817s in a bag because they didn't exist. Uh, but there were portable operators, and uh, things have uh, gotten a little bit easier. Uh, we've got a lot more gear and a lot more computing power uh, in our pockets to tell where we're at and where the satellites are going to be. So I'm going to start out with that. Um, I'm going to apologize to Android users right off the bat. Um, for phones and stuff, I live in the Apple environment, so that's what I know in the programs. Uh, a, big, uh, a big thing to do is to figure out where you're at. And uh, uh, most phones have GPSs built into them these days. Uh, there's a little program called Maidenhead. This is probably not going to work. No, it's not going to work. Uh, Maidenhead is an app. Um, very simple. I think it's free. And it just accesses your GPS and your phone and tells you what your grid square is and then overlays it on a map. And yeah, not going to work. So it's important to know your grid square because a lot of times uh, that's the exchange instead of a signal report or in addition to a signal report. So right now, uh, Maidenhead's telling me I'm in Echo Lima 88, Tango Oscar 62. Well, that's the full maidenhead description, or at least out uh, eight digits. Um, here in the U.S., generally, we only use uh, uh, the first two, Echo Lima 88. Uh, in Europe, uh, the exchange is often the first six, so it would be Echo Lima 88 Tango Oscar uh, with a signal report most of the time. So once you know where you're at, uh, I have another program in there. There are many, many of them. I like Go Sat Watch. Uh, it also accesses the GPS, tells you where you're at, tells the app where you're at, uh, goes through your data connection, and you can download the Keplerian elements for the satellites. And when you download those, you can pick which satellites you want to track, and then you can get a table of pass predictions where uh, it'll name the satellite and give you a map of where you're at uh, and where the satellite's at. Uh, and if I can share my screen here, if you don't want to do all this on your phone, SatPC32 is a very good program. There's lots of other ones, PST Rotator. Um, everybody see that okay? 
the screen coming through okay, Jim? Yeah, fine. It's Graham? perfect. Okay. Fine. perfect. Good. Okay, so uh, I'm zoomed in here on CAS4B. So here you can see, uh, uh, if you haven't seen SAP PC32 before, here's the little white X or cross where I'm at. Uh, let's see, we wanted XW2A. Here's XW2A leaving Northern Europe right now. Gonna come around and down to my west. So this will tell me real time where it's at, but I can also use some of the programs that are included, like Win AOS. Oh, Keplerian problem. Never mind. Sorry, Drew, that's actually showing XW2B to Baker. Oh, good catch. B. Here we go. Hmm. I guess while I'm sharing it, it won't let me change it. Okay, well, let's pretend we're talking about two Baker. Um, SAP PC32 will tell you where it's coming from, where, where it comes up at, where it sets. You can interface it to your radio if you want to, but generally people in the field don't do that. Um, so you'll find that the, the apps on the, um, the phone are what gets used most. Uh, so on my phone, XW2A, it tells me it's coming up at 11.21 a.m. Uh, at almost due north. And it gets up to 17 degrees to the west. And then we'll go down at 11.30 to the southwest. So I see a lot of people when they're doing portable stuff, they'll, you know, they'll have their antenna on a tripod and they'll have a protractor on it or an inclinometer for the elevation and they'll have a compass rose laid out. It's fun to put that stuff together, but I find it to be a little, uh, a little more than you really need. Um, you're using your ear as a pointing feedback mechanism. So the stronger the signal, the better you're pointed at it and the better the polarization. So if you can generally get within uh, a compass quadrant, you know, uh, 90 degrees, 45 degrees either side of where the satellite's at, uh, you can hone in on it without the use of that other stuff. The important thing to know is where it's coming up and where it's going down. And then the next thing would be the midpoint and how high. So behind me is due west. So I know that it's going to be coming up to the north. And it's going to get up to about 17 degrees to the west. So a fist at arm's length is about 10 degrees high. So 10, 20, it's going to get up about that high, about to the top of the trees that you see in the distance. And then it's going to go down to the southwest. So keep that arc in your head. It's going to be kind of a low pass from north up about 17, round up to 20 degrees, and then down to the south. So we got that part down. Now let's talk about uh, the equipment we're going to be using today. Try to turn the laptop here. Uh, any of you the videos from some of the past colloquiums that we did demos outside at, we'll recognize this bag. This is just a, uh, they call it a tactical bag, whatever you want to call it. Drew, this is Graham. Could you stop sharing your screen and then we'll get a bigger picture yeah. of what you're showing? Thanks. Sure, sure. Perfect. Okay. Door. Helps me see things. Now I can see it. <laughs> so normally I would wear this bag around my neck. I'm going to be real honest with you. I want the handcuffs already in water. I got a concrete asphalt outside and I got toast and sunburn. So I'm not putting this around my neck today. Um, but it, I would wear it around my back. It's got two 817s in it. 
Um, I tell you a little funny. Drew, your out. microphone is a bit muffled. Uh, it's in the lap. Uh, Not much I can do. I'll try to talk to it directly. Um, I took these radios recently with me on a work assignment in the Bahamas and operated as uh, C6 AMA, and I hadn't really touched them since then. Uh, and unfortunately, I left the battery pack on in one of them, and the battery went down, and the 817s have a bit of a fault uh, that when the battery voltage gets so low, the clamps start to oscillate and cook themselves. So when I came out earlier today to do a test run, um, I found out my transmit radio was, had no transmit power. So the nice thing with the 817s, if you're using those, is you can just swap them. I've done that several times and the battery went dead. So we've got one radio as an uplink radio. Uh, both of these radios have the wing cam um, lithium ion battery packs uh, where you can charge them through the door. They last a lot longer than the, the packs that come with them. Uh, we have a second radio up top that is now a receive-only radio, and uh, we've got it set to two meters, and the transmit radio is set to 70 centimeters, lower sideband because we're on an inverting transponder, upper sideband to receive. <clears throat> a word about coax. Um, coax, you would think from the numbers, wouldn't make much difference since you're only using five or six feet. But it really, it's really noticeable, especially if you're using old solid core RG58. Uh, that coax just um, is often not up to snuff, up to par. Uh, the center conductors can break in them easily if you flex them a lot. Uh, these are ABR cables. They're available in the states through uh, through uh, HRO. But basically, it's an LMR. A little more cable, ultra flex, so it's a standard center core. And if you notice, I've got a zip tie on one of them here. There's also a zip tie on the other end where it attaches to the antenna. That's my UHF cable. That's just my way of making sure that I don't get them across and have the wrong cable going to the right antenna or, or vice versa. Uh, so, all of the cables out, these are six foot cables. And the antenna I'm using today is an arrow antenna. Now this is the back two thirds of an Alaskan antenna. The Alaskan arrow is a four element on two meters and I think 10 or 11 on, on 70 centimeters. Uh, but the boom splits in three places on this one. Uh, you can take the back two halves of it and put those together and make a, uh, a almost normal size arrow with a little bit of extra bump on UHF. It's got a couple extra elements on UHF. So I find this uh, works as a good uh, compromise. Uh, the Alaskan is really too, too big to handle for very long. Um, you can also use just the back third of the antenna. It comes apart here. And that gives you five elements on 70 centimeters and two elements on two meters. And that works really good for some of the stronger satellites or on high overhead passes. Um, oftentimes, I'll use uh, these radios or an ICOM 910 inside the truck and just hold the back third out the window. Uh, and it's a lot easier to handle than, than the full-size zero antenna. Let's see here. we got about five minutes until AOS. Some other uh, variations on a theme. This was a full-size aero antenna that I got at a hand fest with some damage to it, but the UHF elements were okay. I cut it off right here. I can also make a shorty out of this, a two by five element. But having just a UHF like this, especially on MoJ satellites, uh, where you're going up on two meters and down on 70 centimeters, FO29, FO99, SO50, uh, RS44. Uh, I like using the radio in my truck, mounted in my truck with a whip antenna on top. And I use that for transmit. 
And this is very easy to hold out the window just for receive. So if I have an HC for like SO50, or if I have one of the 817s with me, I'll use the Omni with a little bit more power on the uplink, and then this little antenna and um, just a straight receiver for the downlink. And uh, that works out really well. Been talking about arrow antennas, but we also have the elk antenna. And the elk is a little bit different design. This is actually a two meter log periodic. Uh, it's a little heavier built than the arrow, but it does come apart. You can take each element off. Uh, the two meter design will work on 70 centimeters. It's not a as broad or it's not as a, a focused beam on 70 centimeters. It's a broader, broader beam on 70 centimeters. In my opinion, it's it's a little less effective uh, on 70 centimeters. But uh, one nice thing about it, especially with the Fox satellites, is both since it uses the same elements, um, both the uh, uplink and downlink signals are in the same same plane, same polarity plane. Uh, with the Fox satellites, since one antenna sticks out of the top, one sticks out of the bottom, that's nice. It was really important on AO85 uh, because when you lined up for receive and matched your receive polarity, your transmit was 90 degrees out of phase. So <clears throat> with the, the elk, that's one benefit, at least for the Fox satellites. A lot of guys like the elk. It's a fine antenna. Um, I own both, obviously. Let me look back and check the time here. We got two minutes to AOS. So I'll go back and open up my app here. Drew, can I just ask you a question sure. just, just while we're waiting? Um, and that is, uh, could you just say again what type of coax you recommend? Okay. Um, you, 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 Q, you QSB, we had that microphone problem and, and the answer didn't come sure. through. I recommend. Okay, can you hear me okay now? Yeah, that's fine now. Okay. Um, I recommend an L LMR240 type coax. Uh, no, LMR240 RG8X. Say it again, you broke up again. What's the type of coax? Sorry. L LMR240. LMR240, got it, thanks. Yeah. RG8X is also the same size and is almost as good. But basically, we want to get away from the RG58 cables if you can. OK, that's great. Thanks. I'm looking at a black cloud going overhead right now. <laughs> so <clears throat> normally, with two radios, we're working full duplex. So we're going to be able to hear ourselves on the downlink as we're transmitting. And that's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, on FM, you want to do that to keep from interfering with someone else for two people transmitting at the same time. That's always a problem. If you can hear yourself, if you hear you're not getting through, hopefully somebody will have the, the integrity to let off the screen. On sideband, full duplex is really important because that's how you know your uplink and downlink frequency. Um, and when you do that, you need to wear headphones. Otherwise, you'll get feedback, uh, a squeal. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that's not only annoying to you, it's annoying to the people you're talking to. So unfortunately, if I used uh, headphones on this today, uh, it wouldn't be much of a demonstration. You wouldn't hear anything. But I've got an external speaker plugged in. And if I point that away and get it away from the radio a bit, That'll work okay for a demo. So now we're just about at AOS. We got a minute to go. Uh, so I double check my radios. I'm receiving 125.75. That's right in the middle of the X73 down there. Can you hear the static okay? Uh, yes. Uh, my uplink 435. Turn that back down so we're ready to go. Um, 435.040 is the middle. 
Uh, since the satellite's going to be coming at us, there's about a seven plus or minus seven kilohertz difference. So we're going to start out at uh, 033 or so. And that way we should be pretty close to on frequency when the satellite pops over the horizon, uh, which it just did. I'm going to give it just a, another 30 seconds or so to clear the, some of the bushes and stuff. Um, we can start out by listening for the beacon, which is going to be 145.66 for the CW beacon. So we'll go down to 145.66. Point the antenna generally in that direction. Turn up some volume. Yeah, more volume would be good. Yeah, I'm afraid the noise cancelling is cancelling the actual noise. <laughs> yeah. You guys hear the CW beacon? It's still low. Just need a little bit more about just. I'm sorry. I lost your audio completely. Uh, Drew, see. If, there's, if there's any time in the sound settings, there is a noise cancellation option, which you can set to low. If there's no time, then we'll just have to do it. Audio settings, uh, microphone automatically adjust. Below that, suppress background noise. There's an option low. I don't see a suppress suppress background noise. Okay, just stay close to the okay. microphone and talk up. Thank. Uh, oh, with here lots of I audio. found it. I found it. Suppress persistent background noise. That should do it. Disable aggressive moderate or auto. Disable. <laughs> Disable. Okay. And I'll do that for intermittent. Okay. Hopefully that's better. Sounds good at the moment. All right. Let's find that CW beacon again. That is good. Okay. Good, strong CW beacon. You can almost null it out. Make it go away just by polarity. So I'm going to go back up to the center. Two shows going on. I'm going to go up to the middle. Hello. Get a little bit of defense. Go back to the beacon, see if I'm
by pointing a little better. N8 RO folding system. Go back down to the beacon. Hopefully that was more than just static. So we worked uh, K9UO up in, uh, I think he's in Indiana, uh, and heard uh, N8RO in another station in QSO. Um, XW2A is pretty low, so the passes go quick and the Doppler is hard to, hard to keep up with, but that's, uh, that's, where we're, um, that's where we're at. That's what was available at this time. So uh, happy to answer any questions or any uh okay drew that's fine we'll take a few questions thanks very much for that demo um uh, it was uh, really interesting to see the setup there uh, i'm afraid we missed a little bit on the audio but uh, i think people got the general idea we can certainly hear the beacon okay at times uh, i'm just yeah it's, it... <laughs> i'm just... doing the best we can <laughs> yeah i know exactly uh, I, i'm not bad considering this is the first time you ever done it on a demo on zoom i would guess i can't think of uh Having done one before, no. No. Okay. There, there are a few questions here. Um, could you say a little bit about one or two people are asking a little bit about the battery drain on the eight one sevens, and did it damage the PA? Did you say? Yeah. So um, the original eight seventeens. I don't think it's an issue in the newer in the NDs or the eight one eights. As the internal battery. The, the finals are always connected to the battery, even when you shut it off. And as the battery drains, it's my understanding they go into self-oscillation and will cook themselves. Uh, and it's a little $50 board with the two final transistors on it. Yezu still has them last time I checked. It's a common problem. Um, the Wingcamp battery packs actually have a power switch on the bottom where you can disconnect the battery to help prevent that. Uh, Part of the issue is, is the switch stands proud off of the bottom. And if it's in a bag or something, it'll rub. And apparently that's what happened. Um, you, at that point, you're only getting exciter, you know, a couple milliwatts out. So um, it's easy to tell when it's happened because you get no power indication and, and really no power out. Okay, here's, a, here's, a, here's another question. Um, how do you use, and this is from uh, Max White, how do you use the truck system? Hopefully not driving. Do you use two oh. rigs in using the whip for transmit and then the arrow for receive? No, I, I almost always do it while I'm parked. I, I won't say that I haven't done it um, in motion with somebody else driving, but um, I have a, a Yezu 857 mounted in the truck, which is two meter and 70 centimeter in HF all mode. 
And then I have a uh, dual bander antenna mounted in the middle of the roof. Uh, so I use that as the uplink and generally, um, if I'm doing it on FM, just an HT and the short, uh, the short UHF, UHF only arrow, uh, just out the window. Um, I get big mirrors. Sometimes I just rest my hand on the mirror and I've been known to park in a big empty parking lot and turn the truck as the satellite moves. <laughs> so I'm kind of yeah. lazy that way. Excellent. Drew, I think that's uh, probably all the questions we've got just for the time being. Um, a very big thank you for, for coming on. It's a big effort to, for you to stand out in all that heat, I'm sure. Uh, it's oh, not it's quite, not bad at all. In, it's in fall. UK, it's, uh, well, it's, <laughs> in UK it's fall, but it's not quite 80 degrees, I can assure you of that. Uh, but it's not actually ready now, which is, which is really good. It's really nice to talk to you. And uh, I know you've been uh, in person to uh, the UK many times and stood in our car park and uh, given these demos. So uh, this is the next best thing, given the uh, given our unfortunate circumstances. And uh, well, thank you very much for doing that. And hope to see you in person, uh, maybe next year or whenever. But, I hope uh, so. And we'll see you in the informal session. But I'm going to pack up before yeah, I get rained on. I got back. That's a good lead in. Thanks very much, Drew. Thanks. Um, bye bye. Bye now. Uh, just to say, everybody, uh, we're, we're, we're coming to the end. Uh, Martin is going to close uh, the uh, uh, colloquium uh, formally in a minute. Um, I've just, I have been asked to say, uh, to ask uh, for any contributions to Oscar News. For those who don't know, Oscar News is a quarterly publication that. Uh, um, uh, Slade is the editor, and uh, I write a little sort of column in there. It's probably not worth reading my bit, but uh, a lot of it's uh, interesting. It comes out in colour once, once, uh, once every three months, and um, he would be very happy to uh, uh, get any suggestions or ideas or photographs or short articles or even long ones. And uh, uh, he, his address is uh, editor at ansat.org.uk. I'm pretty certain of that, but uh, I'll have a check. If not, just send them, uh, send them to me. Um, before I hand over to Graham, I would just like to say a couple of other things, and that is a, another very big thank you to, to Wuta. Uh, take a bow, Wuta. He's not there. I am there. It there just it takes is. a while. Excellent. Thank you, Wuta. Uh, great job. I uh, haven't quite finished yet, but uh, um, uh, without you, it would have been uh, much, much, much more, much more difficult. And uh, thank, thanks for all your help and everyone else who's been uh, involved. Um, after the after we close, we're going to put up a slide with Graham's email address and, and my email address. I'm with, happy to have any comments. Um, the informal session. I'm not. I'm absolutely. Um, there's nothing planned for it at all. Um, it might get completely uncontrollable if there are a lot of people in. Um, but if you want to stay, you'd be very welcome. Uh, and uh, we will go down and we'll promote anyone who's left by about quarter to six. Do you start at six BST? And anyone who's left about quarter to, we'll promote you to panelists so you can at least speak. And yeah, you when you to... say left, sorry, Jim, when you say left, you mean anyone who's still online. Thank you. Yes. You don't mean left. Sorry. No, I don't mean left. Oh, sorry. Anyone who is left online, anyone who remains online. Uh, we will uh, promote you to, uh, uh, to panelists. We might have to sort of limit you slightly if they're, if they're low, because it will become bedlam if we're not careful. But basically the, uh, the people you heard speaking will be on and uh, uh, hopefully we can have a, a reasonable discussion. Who knows, but buy your own beer and that'll follow at six o'clock. Uh, that's all I've got. So um, over to you, Graham, and you can just say anything you've got to say and then uh, Martin can close the uh, colloquium formally. Over. Okay, uh, no, nothing from me. Um, straight over to Martin, I would think. Thank you. Oh, right. Thank you, Graham. Anyway, no, I mean, it, it, it's um, first of all, it was uh, great to see Drew out in the uh, in the warmth there. Here, it, it, it's, uh, I know, it must probably be about 30 degrees cooler. Um, and in fact, it's got a bit chillier during the day. So I've had to don an extra jacket here. Um, but uh, no, it was great to see the, uh, uh, the demo, Drew. So thanks very much for, for putting that on. And also, I, you know, the video on satellite uh, construction uh, rang a lot of bells for me. There were a lot of uh, hints and experiences that have been, uh, you know, lessons learned, which uh, I could recognize. Uh, and, you know, I think the underlying message is that, 
you know, space is pretty unforgiving. And so everything needs to be really examined and run through as, uh, as much as possible beforehand. And that you always run out of time. You know, however soon you start and however much time you reckon you're going to have at the end to do all the testing, you inevitably uh, run short on that. And so the more you can test early, uh, the better. But uh, that's uh, spoken from a heartfelt uh, uh, experience, particularly on the uh, going back to USAT 2 in 1984, where we were still uh, building bits of the, uh, the, the UHF transmitter. Uh, at the launch site as they were banging on the door asking us to put the, the, uh, the satellite on the rocket. Uh, but I'm pleased to say that um, that, that transmitter is still working and, and it was uh, actually tracked uh, only uh, last week. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a fun game. Anyway, it was really great to, to listen to all the, the presentations. I'd like to add my thanks to all those who have spent the time to, to, uh, to join and also to you know, present their thoughts and ideas and, and contributions today. Um, I'm also want to thank the whole team who, who's put this together. And I'm not going to call them out individually because I'm going to forget somebody, and uh, and that would be a shame. But everybody who's you know helped uh, with getting the program together, with uh, sorting out all the IT related stuff, and and masterminding the the the, uh, uh, the day, it's it's been good. You know, it's a shame that we can't meet uh, in person due to the um, COVID pandemic. On the other hand, yeah, we have had a very large audience and uh, hopefully there will be a bit more participation in the informal session as well. So it has had uh, some benefits, um, but uh, it's always nice, of course, to have a, a, a more of a face-to-face uh, -face chat and uh, to, to talk to people in, in person. But yeah, it's been a, a fantastic uh, uh, alternative and I want to thank everybody who's for putting it together. So with that I guess uh, it's it, it's a it's a honor to close the uh, colloquium 35th colloquium for this year and to uh, pass it the uh, the baton back to Jim as no doubt master of ceremonies to wrap it up and just make sure that everybody knows where to go for the informal session assuming they haven't already vanished off uh, to get a cup of coffee, tea, or down the pub, or breakfast, or whichever time zone you happen to be in. So thank you very much, and uh, great to see everybody on, and uh, we'll look forward to next year. Over to you, Jim. Okay, Martin, thanks Thanks very much indeed. I've not really much else to say. Um, Slade has just emailed me with uh, the correct address for the, uh, um, uh, for the Ask News editor. It's on-editor at ansat.org, on-editor at ansat.org. Uh, that's, that's all we've got for the, for the Mo. Uh, we're gonna take a break for um, oh, an hour or so, um, uh, well, six o'clock or maybe a bit earlier if we get really bored. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to seeing you then. So uh, if you want to join the informal session, uh, which will start around about six o'clock, uh, if not a bit before, um, just stay where you are, stay online, and uh, we'll un unmute everybody for one or two at a time. Just see how many people who stay. Hopefully it won't be bedlam, but, uh, but we'll see. Thank you very much for attending, and thank you to all our speakers again. And um, uh, that's, that's all I've got. So maybe Wuji could put on some pleasant music or a little video or whatever you've got. See you later, everybody.
They've been receiving and decoding messages here at Bletchley Park for decades. But this is a first even for this place. We're in mini mission control. For the past four years, this group of amateur radio enthusiasts and space buffs have been working on a project to create a satellite and then use it to send and receive messages around the globe. They call it the fun cube. And guess what? It works. The satellite's expected to orbit the Earth for around 25 years and the batteries inside to last for five to 10 years. But look at how small it is. This is the exact size. Amazing when you consider what a clever little piece of kit this is. These days, we're all communications experts, thanks to smartphones and the internet. So what makes the Fun Cube so special? It's the amateur radio concept of being able to talk to other people around the world, which has now been, to a degree, replaced by Skype and things like that. But there are still many, many people around the world who enjoy the challenge of using the ionosphere, which is a fairly random effect, natural effect, natural system, uh, rather than using a, a man-made network. Now, can anyone have a guess why there's this bit, which is, looks like it's really bright, and this bit, which looks like it's really dark. The other Sorry. main aim of the project is to spark nope. an interest in science, engineering and maths among children. What do you think is going to happen if I turn and point this aerial directly at the satellite? Soon, schools will be able to buy an aerial and a tiny receiver to enable them to download information from the satellite up in space directly into the classroom computer back down here on Earth. I thought it was really interesting. It was just, I didn't really hear much about it before and it was just like, wow. The solar panels, um, the aerials and all that, it was quite interesting. So maybe I'll take some, up some, uh, this one along. GB3 RS, GB3 RS, Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra. GB3 RS. This project isn't about pushing back the boundaries of our scientific knowledge, but it is boldly going into the future via the next generation of space explorers. John Maguire, BBC News at Abbey's Primary School in Bletchley. Уже в 1971 году ее начали испытывать на борту новой межконтинентальной баллистической ракеты СС-18 в конструкции Михаила Янгеля и Владимира Уткина, которую на Западе прозвали «Сатана». Ракета имела разделяющуюся головную часть из десятью ядерными блоками. Каждый из них наводился на цель с точностью 400 метров. Полетные задания закладывались в память компьютера. Поэтому время приведения сатаны в полную боевую готовность составило всего 30 секунд. Для предстартовой калибровки командных приборов боевым расчетом уже не нужно было вручную подключать наземное оборудование.
Now, this must beat most lessons in school, surely. Today, children in Bristol made contact with our very own astronaut, Tim Peake, in space. They said the experience was simply out of this world. They had 10 minutes asking him questions on board the International Space Station, and Tim, who uh, lived in Wiltshire once, told the uh, wannabe astronauts to work hard and follow their dreams. Scott Ellis was there. Tim Peake laps the world 15 times every day, 17 and a half thousand miles an hour and 250 miles distant. Little wonder they cheered at the Oasis Academy in Shire Hampton when he answered their call and answered some pretty tough questions. Why should we continue to fund expensive space missions when we have more pressing problems on Earth? We're doing cancer research. We are trying to solve the world's energy problems. We're looking at climate change. My aim is to be the first female Afghan astronaut. What would be the mo one most important piece of advice that you have for me? Over. I think, uh, I think that's a wonderful ambition to have. I think the best advice is to follow your dreams, to work hard, and just enjoy the journey. And I'm sure you'll get there. Good luck. Over. The hookup came about because the school caretaker is a keen amateur radio enthusiast. It was his fellow colleagues who made the voice link to space possible. So this is it, last few seconds before liftoff. And keeping up the interstellar theme, the school launched a weather balloon 20 kilometres into space yesterday, taking these impressive pictures before crash landing near Marlborough. Space is our next big adventure um, and, and it is happening. We've got missions to Mars and hopefully inspiring another generation to get involved and to be part of it. From up here, you realise just how fragile the Earth is. The excitement and the tension in the school hall today was electric. A 10-minute window as Tim Peake raced overhead. I, I still haven't fully comprehended what's just happened, to be perfectly honest. And how does that rate as a school day? Just the best day ever. One of the best days in my life. I'm just still trying to get over how mind-blowing it was just to be able to have contact with someone on the International Space Station. It was a true honour, true privilege to be to speaking to him and I cannot get over it again. I can't. It was the best day in my life. After 10 minutes, Tim was gone, slipping off once more beyond our earthly horizon, but leaving inspiration behind him. Scott Ellis, BBC Points West, Shirehampton. I'm going to get Esme to ask the first question, okay? And Esme, I think, is pretty much one of the youngest people I think has asked to an astronaut in a space station. So really, really well done, okay? Right, so, okay. here we go. GB1SS, Golf Bravo 1, Sierra, Sierra. This is GB1 APS, Golf Bravo 1, Alpha Papa, Sierra. Listening and standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. GB1SS, GB1SS, this is Golf Bravo 1, Alpha Papa Sierra, listening and standing by for a scheduled contact on the International Space Station. Over. Hello, Golf Bravo 1, Alpha Papa Sierra, this is Golf Sierra Sierra, I read you bye bye nine, I'll be over. GB1SS, GB1 APS, returning. Welcome, Tim, to Ashfield Primary School in Yorkshire. Uh, we have you on Ham TV, so please give us all a wave. And are you ready for your first question? Over. Hello, Ashfield Primary School. It's great to be talking to you this morning. I'm ready. Over. I am Esme. I am Esme. Uh, how can I help you? 
come and see you. I am a my own gun. I come and see you over. Hi, Esme. It's great to talk to you this morning. I wish you could come and see me. I'd love to show you around the International Space Station. I'd love to show you planet Earth. But you you would need to jump on a rocket, um, and you'd need to have to travel up to 17,500 miles per hour. So that's really far. So maybe it's better if I come and see you in a few weeks' time when I'm back on planet Earth. Over.